which premium SUV to buy. This one is my favorite hit list video of different SUVs and they're all in the premium segment but different size segments indeed. So for example we have bigger ones like the BMW iX as electric competitor and the BMW X5 here in one video with the pre-facelift version that still has some AC buttons and so on. On our channel you can also find the facelifted version. Also presenting here the Audi Q8, in this case the RS Q8. I picked that one because this review was on Tenerife, a beautiful landscape, so a very special memory indeed. And then the segment below, which would be mid-size in Europe, but already maybe compact in the US, BMW X3 and Mercedes GLC. We have them also directly next to each other because they are um, among my favorite one in this very segment there and the GLC with a lot of technology advantage, for example, always depending then on the price. And also as the non-German competitor, the Genesis GV70, that one is available as all electric, but also with petrol and so on. So that one was pretty cool and also has a more conservative cockpit layout, but also good quality. And the Porsche Macan as the most agile competitor because this is really a lot of fun to put it in bends and so on and we have here a very special road in this review for you beautiful landscape and also great driving indeed Macan T in this case of course you can also go for the six cylinders and not to forget especially because of the great seating comfort the Volvo competitors the XC60 would be in the segment of the X3 and the GLC but also I want to put the XC40 in here if you rather want to go for a little smaller one because the XC40 already basically offers a lot of features or the feeling of a bigger one whereas it still has very very compact dimensions on the outside therefore it kind of has the wild card here in this review so enjoy all of the in-depth looks right now and tell me later in the comments which one is your favorite you want to see more comparison videos here with thomas and autogefühl here it is bmw ix versus BMW X5 and also the question electric or petrol. The powerful versions here, the X550 versus the M50i, these are the comparable power versions with that V8 under the hood and of course this electric performance. This will be so interesting, I can promise you. Let's go directly with the exterior. With the iX here with this mono kitten here, I would say high and wide then here not with the split and it has this automatically repairing function that when you have slight scratches it repairs itself in harsh sunlight or with a hairdryer this is no joke indeed and then horizontally put lamps in the front you can also get the BMW laser light you can see it here with the blue accentuations and a strong lower part here as well but the more closed look and a little bit lower for the overall experience and here the X5 you can see a more traditional kidney here double kidney in the front with the M50i you also have everything you can get, actually get here with the shadow line everything blacked out so a more sinister look tanzanite blue is the color here a nice and very elegant dark blue color these here are also the laser lights it's an option you can also equip it with here in the more traditional daytime running light strong accentuations here in that m performance version in the lower part so if you take one more comparing look here the x5 here more traditional styling and i would say i do prefer that especially because i so much more like that double kidney whereas i'm not such a fan of that mono kidney the iX does look more unique and people look at, oh wow, what is that? It catches more attention, definitely. But just on the styling wise in the front, it's the X5 for me. What about you? Let's continue. Hey, that's a cool comparison shot here. Is it? <laughs> in the side profile. The iX, 4 meters 95 or 195 inches. The X5, almost the same length. 94 inches or 4 meters 92 and 
yeah, you know, these two and a half, three centimeters or an inch is the difference also in the wheelbase. Wheelbase slightly longer here in the iX, but not really a big difference. The X5, you can see, has the more upright building form. We have 21 inch wheels, comparable 21 inch here for both vehicles, here the X5 and Definitely here the more classic conservative setup. I really like the X5 styling. It is bold, it is more angular actually. And when we move over to the X, sorry, iX. <laughs> yeah, I guess X, 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 X. <laughs> here we also have 21 inch wheels, so we can really compare the driving comfort definitely. And also here you can see then, it's just flatter, as flat as an X6 rather. And a rather sleek line here and it's just more stretch and a little bit less angular overall but definitely in length and wheelbase both are very comparable as for suspension for both you can either get the normal adaptive suspension or opt it up with the air suspension since it's the m50i with the x5 we have the normal adaptive suspension day in here with the air suspension but they both come very close these bmw suspension i can already tell you so far more details than soon in the driving part. This will be super interesting. Here at the rear, I still also prefer the X5 in a way because of the more traditional styling. Nice tail lamp design here with the LED as well. And I also prefer the X5 if you compare it to the X6 because this SUV Coupe style is, yeah, sometimes doubtful as well design. Let's take it that way. Here in the lower part, AFAP alert, auto food fake exhaust police, because the outer tip is, you know, just for beauty reasons, then the rear ones on the inside with that V8 here. However, the iX from the rear design, I think it's also beautifully done here with that very slim stretch. So that's to me actually pretty cool as well. As for the top speed, the iX here in the X Drive 50 version is at 200 kilometers an hour or 125 miles an hour. You can go as fast as the X5, that is then 250 kilometers an hour or 155 miles an hour if you go for the M60 version of the iX that is also available. Top speed wise these would be then more comparable you know but power output wise and acceleration wise these here are more comparable then. It's very interesting and also price wise I can already tell you so far the X5 as a base X5 starts lower at the price. But here, if you pick them the comparable power output versions, they exactly cost the same money and they're both around one or 20,000 euros or dollars. That's very interesting, isn't it? Four liter V8 for the BMW X5 M50i. Woo! And the acceleration figure here is 4.3 seconds, two mile kilometers or 62 miles an hour, where it is 4.6 seconds with a closed hood for the BMW iX X Drive 50. You cannot open the hood, there is no frunk underneath. Yeah, that's the thing. This one here, the iX, would be quicker than the acceleration when you again go for the M60 version and the X5 would be a little bit slower than this one here when you go for the 40i version for the six cylinder. Remember, the six cylinder petrol engine will be way more fuel saving than this eight cylinder here. So it is, let's say, a more clever choice. And to me, it also fits a little bit more to the vehicle. However, the V8 has, of course, even a greater sound, which will also be a major difference in driving when we compare the petrol and the electric one. As for the range, very interesting. When this one is here fueled up fully, you can score some 700 kilometers easily, you know, some 450 miles. However, even more range just with the six cylinder. Here with the iX, you can score something as high as 400 miles or 650 kilometers in best conditions, ideal summertime. More realistic is 500 kilometers or 300 miles. And in winter time or with high autobahn speed, then it drops a little bit, you know, less below. And of course, fueling it up, this one here, 35 minutes, 10 to 80% state of charge and a, at a, you know, very good fast charger. And here, well, two minutes at the fuel station.
now to the interiors and also have different key fobs. This is the optional, let's say, computer key. Of course, you can also get a more simple one for the X5. And this is the one for the X, uh, iX. I always mistake it. It's, it's, yeah, it's getting complicated. <laughs> now the interiors here. This is the more classic conservative layout, two times 12.3 inch screens. Also with a lot of real buttons here, single button for everything at the steering wheel, single button for the heated steering wheel, for example. So let's say more simplified, BMW OS 7 as well. And then there's this new, very futuristic lounge interior for the iX and with more hashtag capacitive BS and here this one curved screen layout, 12.3 inch on the left side, 14.9 on the right side, but it looks like it would be one screen. However, we've seen with the X7 facelift that the X5 probably will also soon get this layout with the BMW OS 8 operation system and also this one screen curved layout. And then also the climate unit will change here at the X5. It's still manual at this point when we record the video with the soon coming X5 facelift. It will also then be that the climate unit is in the screen. Let's take a detailed look. But I want to know from you, which basic layout would you prefer? This more futuristic lounge layout here with the iX or the more classic BMW layout with the X5? Tell me in the comments. Now we're getting inside the X5 here with a classic door handle and an awesome door closing sound. I love that. That's what I prefer actually. And then getting inside. So here, this rather classic layout, good and comfortable seating position. These seats here, by the way, at the moment, the animal skin equipment, but they're also available in sensor tech in different colors. And you want to go animal free. That's also what I would recommend. Steering wheel up and down, in and out, electric way. And it has this more round shape. This, however, the M steering wheel, where you have a thicker grip here in the top part. And with 189 or six foot two, still leaves a lot of headroom. There is a panoramic roof available, not with this very vehicle at this moment, but this one has the Alcantara ceiling. Yeah, more than a thousand of euros or dollars or more than a thousand euros, more than a thousand euros or dollars <laughs> extra price here for the Alcantara ceiling. Very expensive, but pretty beautiful. And now we come to a moment, you know these situations that someone tells you something and then you see something totally differently and you can't get it out of your head anymore. So this is a spoiler or warning that this moment will come right now because take a look at these seats. What do you see? What form or what kind of body position does it remind you of? You know, here with the upper area and the head restraints, no matter which of the seats. To me, I looked at that and I totally saw immediately here, like, like someone would, you know, <laughs> like, you know, doesn't it totally look like this? <laughs> like when someone pulls the shoulders up? Sorry, now you will always see it. <laughs> India we're over here with the X5 with a more classic setup here. I think a nice integration of the screens here. By the way, pretty cool, the carbon fiber inserts, but they cost more than a thousand euros or a thousand dollars extra. But at least then you have less high gloss piano lacquer for that. When we start the engine, by the way, we can see this one here still has the climate unit like this. And you also hear some of the V8. I do prefer as it is right here. Yeah, I'm just afraid that it does lose it. And it, we can expect that it does lose it like the X7. Then the AC unit also goes into that one here with the, with the face and so on. So I prefer the more conservative user interface. Uh, I, I can say it that way. Here in the lower part, by the way, you can slide this one open, then you have inductive charging pad. You can use it also for this computer key, then it does charge. Adaptive cup holders here. To me, they are also a little bit better than in the iX. And then, yes, a real shifting lever. This one here for the sport shifting mode, pretty cool. And the control lever here with a classic setup. You can control it while driving, for example. To me, that's the better solution. Now let's take a quick look at the screens. At this moment, BMW OS 7, and I think that's the easiest solution. Look at that. On the left side, you have all the menus you need, possibly, and everything has a good overview. And I don't really need much more. You have this home screen, um, but usually I just use the one on the left side. And car can be accessed directly here. To me, that's all I need. And then the Apple CarPlay hotkey right here. 
it's a good integration like this. And this one is equipped with the optional Harman Kardon sound system, which has a great, very true 3D surround sound. Yeah, I just love that. And the digital instruments, you can't change too much in there. Here, right side, the RPMs, left side, the speed. And that display, nothing special, but always nice to have. Rear seating here of the X5. You can see the classic setup. Not too much of space, although it's a long car. You can already see that. Inside, how's the seating position and headroom and so on. So it is sufficient here in like room, no problem. And here also headroom, no problem. It's yeah, actually very comfortable. You can easily house four adults. It doesn't have a too high middle tunnel here, so it's actually also okay here with five tall adults, a little bit stiff on the middle seat, but that works. So overall, I'm quite happy here with the rear area. Of course, when you look from here to the front, it's not as impressive as the iX, just from the visuals from the inside. These rather hidden door handles for the iX and frameless doors. And that leads also to yeah, a very bad door closing sound. That's the catch of it. So inside of the doors, this is an, in this case animal skin. Uh, however, you can also get it with Sensatec leatherette. Same for the seats. This is an animal skin seat, but they are Sensatec seats. They are very beautiful, also available in black and beige, for example, we had them, and also in brown. So there are enough animal-free choices. Definitely this different lounge interior setup. Getting in, it's a little bit lower, that whole vehicle, and headroom is also plenty no problem at all and there's also a panoramic roof available for this one the difference is this panoramic roof when you would have one is closed always you cannot open it you can just dim it the other one in the x5 you can also open it and yeah it is definitely a different seating position you sit overall lower not this super high command driving position but the visual effect of is of course more yeah you know evoking more impressive interior overview here for the iX super impressive definitely with that yeah unique steering wheel setup it looks cool to handle not sure not really an advantage but you get along somewhat I would say very clean definitely right here and with the latest BMW OS8 then you have this flying middle console here right here this crystalline um, turning lever by the way <laughs> well, you can also get it in the normal base version, then you have high gloss piano, like that. that's the disadvantage. But this one can be blinding when there's some sun rays in there. Here with the matte wood, of course, that is really cool and very clean setup here once again. When you select the driving modes here, that's more complicated because you have to select it here and then have to press it in the screen or select it there and then select it with the turning jog here and then it stays like this and when you want to go back to the GPS you have to hit the GPS button so that's to me a little bit too complicated and this is the theme here of that vehicle also here with the climate control inside here yes we know that will be expected for the X5 to me they have made the user interface more complicated that's the downside of the vehicle although it looks really awesome Oh, look at these little clouds, nice visualization. So it is quick here, so they have enough processing power, definitely. Here on the left side, you miss the car menu, and that is, to me, really hit and miss. So I want to have these car features, but then I have this all apps view, and there's apps all over the place. It's just too much. You can limit it to vehicle apps, but then where do I find what? I have no idea, and I don't want to you know, have such a mess in the infotainment system. Or what about you? So I think maybe taking it a step back, the OS7 was just easier to use. This is the CarPlay integration, or Android Auto also possible for the iX, just wireless. And here we have the Harman Kardon sound system. And I think it's, once again, a great sound. Comparable, definitely, maybe the resonance room here is even a little bit better in the iX. Hey, yeah. Uh, Maybe it's a little bit more awesome, the sound even. You know, there's also um, the Bowersmith Wilkin system available, which is even more expensive, 4D. But I think the Harman Kardon system is absolutely fine. Then the digital instruments, you have the startup sounds, iconic sounds by Hans Zimmer. Mm -hmm. mm. 
they really necessary? Not sure. These here, you cannot turn them off. You can just turn off the sounds of the driving experience. That can be turned off, but not the startup sound. Here, you can also change the contents and also the whole layout of the thing. So you're a little bit more flexible with these instruments. Overall, hmm. Yeah, I think they have become more complicated once again. By at least you can adjust it then how you like it. And the iX also features a head-up display. If you have some GPS guidance, you will even see more of that there. In the rear, they are using this EV platform. No middle tunnel whatsoever. Let's see about the legroom and headroom result. Right here, yeah, this is a little bit more legroom even. Um, yeah, really using this platform as well. So that's actually quite cool. But this is actually, you know, the thing we have a little bit more in wheelbase, a little bit more uh, there, like this, you know, couple of centimeters. So that's actually well done. Headroom wise, also no problem at all. And it's also comfortable. So it is definitely comparable as for the rear experience. Here you feel a little bit more spacious, especially when you move to the middle seat. So driving with five toy adults is seating wise more comfortable. Just the back part here is to me a little bit um, harder. So that's the difference. You can get along in the rear with both vehicles. Both have a very comfortable result. Of course, here, you know, more cozy open space experience. Now the trunk comparison, they open quite differently. Here the iX, one hatch, and the X5 has this split hatch. And the cool thing is it has some more character, I think, because you can have this picnic function in here of that lower area and just enjoy yourself or each other. <laughs> so I think it's a cool solution, definitely. I, I mean, maybe it's not always the most practical thing, but I just find it cool, you know. What well, about the figures? 500 liters here, 100 liters more than in the iX for the X5, a meter in length, easily a meter or 40 inches in width, a little bit more even. And now the height that is interesting is about, yeah, more than 80 centimeters or 32 inches. This is a difference then, overall very well usable. Let's move over. 400 liters, 100 liters less for the iX. And what is actually the difference? So we have here the length with a little bit more than a meter. So a little bit more. Width also easily a little bit more than a meter or 40 inches. But now the height, that is more limited, more at 75 centimeters or less. Yeah, about like 29 inches. So you lose a little bit of height. So it's a little bit more narrow there. And then you have a different angle here and that's why you also lose these leader figures. Welcome to Thomas's Comparison Driving Lounge, starting with the BMW X5 in the M50i with the 4.4 liter V8. Great performance. Sports mode, that we also have some quick shifting. Well, and let's also put it to the sports shifting mode here, putting the shifting lever to the left side. And we'll let Car pass. Uh, one more, just just for safety precautions, because we will be very very quick. From 40 kilometers an hour, let's go. Two hundred, one twenty-five miles an hour. Wow, <laughs> that sound. And we go further, and this is also a difference here with the combustion engine. We can go 250 kilometers an hour. This is the top speed right now. Whoa, impressive, super impressive indeed. And how calm and stable this vehicle remains also at higher speeds. Not sure why this light truck is here on the left lane. Here also with the adaptive BMW suspension. Wow, that lane change. We have a huge SUV, but there's no problem in lane changing and it stays so upright and calm and collected. That is just awesome. And that's also a thing about air suspension versus the normal BMW adaptive suspension. In the X5, you can get that adaptive suspension, the adaptive M suspension with the sportier tune here in the M50i version or the adaptive air suspension and usually the air suspension is always better as for the comfort 
not necessarily as for replacing it cost-wise when it gets broken and sometimes then of course an air suspension is more expensive if you hold the car for a long long time but here the adaptive BMW suspension is so good actually that it's keeping the it says keeping keeping the lane please Thomas <laughs> so the adaptive suspension is so good actually that at some point with the X5 and the X7 I say you can easily go for the adaptive suspension and you don't need an air suspension so this here the big BMW adaptive suspension here in the X3 X5 and so on W5 series is one of my favorite adaptive suspensions overall and it is indeed so good so so well combining sportiness and comfort that you do not miss an air suspension so here it's absolutely fine not to big the air suspension it's incredible how sporty the car is although it's so big and heavy and at the same time great comfort although we have huge wheels mounted there that is an extraordinary achievement indeed and of course you can also go for an air suspension but to me it doesn't bring you a big comfort plus here in the x5 and the x7 again not because the air suspension wouldn't be any good just because the normal adaptive suspension is so great and here in the m trim it is combined with the stiffer node you have the sport here right and especially here at higher speeds but still it's not that you would say Oh, I can't take this as a primary uh, comfort car for everyday driving life or something. This is totally fine then still. So, um, yeah, this is the thing about the X5 in general. It has had such great handling and to me, driving-wise, my favorite full-size SUVs are really the BMW X5 or the X6 if you prefer that coupe line and then the Audi Q8 or Q7 also depending you know if you want that coupe line or not um, between the Q7 and the Q8 I feel there's a bigger difference than between the X than between X5 and X6 yeah. I'm leaning more towards either Q8 or the X5 somehow um, because the X5 has this you know more practical trunk the Q8 doesn't lose much practicability and don't need the space of the Q7 so that would be you know my pick then in this case SQ5 petrol or here the X5 with the 6 cylinder because here the 8 cylinder it does quite go quite high in the consumption figures at least 11 liters on one kilometers if you really use it more like 14 liters on one kilometers so you either minimum um, some 20 mpg US 25 mpg UK or more realistic less than 20 mpg US the more like 16 17 mpg US and barely 20 mpg UK that's a realistic consumption figure and there of course the IX is way more efficient if you want to go same high speeds by the way you have to go for the M60 version with the IX but here today we picked the 50 version that's why the manufacturers do that with these strange numbers nowadays that you can indeed also power wise compare the electric versions and the combustion engine versions and these are the ones actually power wise comparable and in general well how is the felt difference of course soon we'll drive the ix and we, we can tell you more about that but i've driven the ix in so many different versions so far and the thing is both feel kind of heavy at the same time they really very well combine sportiness and comfort you do feel that the ix has a lower center of gravity that helps in sportier driving and also feels more settled on the road just in very tight corners where you're hard on the brakes and the vehicle is being pushed outwards the ix does have some added weight yeah, but then again the center of gravity is lower mm. So I'm really looking forward. Soon, you know, we'll do one, one more auto one acceleration. I'll also already put it in the sport shifting mode, so then the gears are turned up later. We will have some winding. No, that truck will not go in front of me again. <laughs> so um, later on, we will have small, tight winding corners, and this will be very interesting. So and there's a bully behind me now, although I'm driving the speed that is allowed. But now I say. Goodbye.
<laughs> yes, I could be a German Bond villain, definitely, definitely. I'm free to do that, you know, for any directors watching. <laughs> ah, more than 200 kilometers an hour, 125 miles an hour, and it feels so sporty. No overtaking a uh, BMW Z4, and we're saying like, what the hell, I'm supposed to have the sports car? No, I have the sports car, you at the moment, <laughs> it feels like that. Wow, amazing sporty performance, feels so great, and noise insulation wise, awesome. I mean, over 200 kilometers an hour, more than 125 miles an hour, feels like nothing. It almost feels like standing still. It's not too loud in here. The car feels so smooth. This is a great piece of engineering indeed, and yeah. Hello, Mr. Bond. Welcome to my realm. You will now die from the sharks in the pond. <laughs> okay. So far as for the Bond villain thing, again, my application is standing. Now we're heading into some countryside roads. And also the, oh, this is so great. I mean, I'm just having so much fun. Yeah, the traffic is still green. Now 90 degree corner. Oh, awesomeness. Wow. This was, by the way, a stop sign indicator. Of course, at this point, the stop sign was irre irrelevant because there was the green traffic light. If you wonder in Germany, a stop sign and green traffic light means that if the traffic light at some point would fail or if it's maybe turned off in nighttime, then the stop sign counts. But as long as, tra as uh, there's a traffic light, all this traffic light is counting. Wow. Cruise control. You can set it here on this assisted driving mode as well. And then, let's see, yeah, assisted driving, and then we can also, uh, yeah, here we go. And there's the green steering symbol, and let's see how smooth that is. See here, no hectic steering movement, but rather very, very smooth. That works well. Yeah, assistance systems wise, let's see that corner. Yeah, look at that, even in that rather tight corner, it's meant to do autobahn assisted driving, you know, but even here, it was doing that very, very well. So, the thing is, I'm getting along so well with that vehicle here. I know the operation system, 7.0 system, and it's, to me, a little bit simpler than in the iX. However, we have to remember that the X5 will get that, <laughs> will get that update here that we know from the X7 face it, it will be the same. And then also, infotainment and screens wise, there won't be a big difference anymore between iX and X5, depending on if you watch this review at a later stage or if you watch it when it's you know, really, really fresh, or maybe you think about getting a used one or so. I'm a little bit more confident with the more traditional conservative design. Also, when I have here the climate unit to control manually, again, this will change at some point then. But the big question is really then X5 or iX. And at this point, you know, when we start driving with the X5, it's really hard to pick any other SUV to that. Um, as I said, I really like the Q8. It's also so much fun in driving. That would be definitely a harsh, you know, a hard, hard pick or a hard thing to do really. Yeah, by the way, yeah, going back to normal shifting, but we also go to the comfort mode. We have a more balanced setting. Gears are not turned that high than here in the comfort shifting mode and also normal comfort mode. The suspension is a little bit more forgiving and so on, so uh, rather smooth ride. Mm. I mean, size-wise, X5 and iX are somewhat similar, definitely. The wheelbase also doesn't differ that much. I told you earlier, just a couple of centimeters, the iX has more on wheelbase, so they have some similarities. You do feel that the X5 is higher here on the inside and also on the outside. Remember that the iX has the length of an X5, the height of an X6 and the wheels of an X7. So the X5 feels more traditional SUV definitely. Actually the iX more feels a little bit than then the X6 I would say in a way. Uh, although, although it doesn't really have that coupe shape. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah, it's really, really, really tough to say, but um, you definitely have a more traditional conservative layout here with the X5. Um, I would say, especially when you're used to so far BMWs, of course, you get along a little bit better. I feel also that the steering wheel is better to handle. The iX steering wheel is more freakish, as it's very, very, how could you say, not even modern design, it's more like um, experimental design with the iX. And this to me handles a little bit better, definitely. Uh, from the overview, the X5 is also better as for this more you know, upright uh, form from the windows and so on. And, um, hmm. yeah. I mean, we, we soon reach now these winding corners part. This will be a very, very important test, maybe even the important test. Not that everyone would do winding corners with these cars all the time, but there we can find out more about the individual characteristics, but I can already tell you so far, after driving both, yeah, the choice is getting harder and harder and harder. What will I do? But first of all, let's hit the corners. One more time to the sports mode and to the sports shifting mode. Yeah, that V8 does make a difference sound-wise, so if you ask yourself, is it better with the V8 sound than with the electric boost sound? Yeah, of course it is. <laughs> yeah. Whoa. Nice. We have also the rear exit steering here that helps when parking in and out, but also getting out of the corners. And let's see and remember also how much it pushes to the outside of the corners. For such a heavy SUV, hardly. And nice acceleration out. Rear axle bias, of course, or rear bias for that all-wheel drive. It drives so extremely well. Yeah, I can just underpin that. And of course, the V8 sound is great. Still, for efficiency reasons, in this case, I would still go for the six-cylinder in the X5 and yeah, like the 40i and this will also be absolutely fine power-wise, definitely. But now the question is, how does the iX relate to this here? And now to the BMW iX Sport mode and I also go from 40 km an hour to the German Autobahn, let's go. Plop, 200 km an hour, 125 miles an hour. That's also the top speed in here for the X-Drive 50 version. Faster, also 250 km an hour, would also go with the M60 version. And here also at high speeds, good noise insulation, very stable on the, low, on the road, low center of gravity, nice lane changing. You feel that the car is a little bit lower and the center of gravity is lower, that's also helpful. As for wind noise, the thing is, yeah, also great result overall. Um, because you don't have the engine sound, you might subjectively think it's louder, especially here from that area and also when you have some cars passing by, but it is also a super, super silent ride. It is really tough to say which one is exactly more silent. Both are very silent. I feel just that the difference that the, you know, subjective note that maybe the X5 would be more silent. I think it rather comes from that the engine in the X5 covers some of the smaller wind noise that would come, you know, some from here like this, a car passes by and you hear that a little bit more prominently when there's no engine running. So that's, I think, the, the main difference. Yeah, I'm getting off of the motorway now here. The thing is really, the user interface in the X5 is to me definitely better, less complicated than this one here. Sadly, as I said, the X5 will get the same updates and then will be like in the X7 or, you know, similar co or comparable to this one here. So user interface wise, I would rather say get the X5 now, <laughs> but you still have the, uh, like this, this easier user interface, you know, that would to me be the cooler thing, definitely. 
and with a silent yet sporty and performance experience. Energy consumption wise, you can score here in summertime great results with the iX. Some 17 kilometers on one kilometer, 17 kilowatt hours on one kilometers, or 27 kilowatt hours on 100 miles, and that would rather mean a range of 650 kilometers or 400 miles. A more realistic figure, if you have some more, um, let's say, you know, a little bit more performance driving, more higher speed autobahn, you can still easy score 500 kilometers or 300 miles, just in very very cold winter time. Um, that might drop down, you know, so uh, and even high-speed driving, we once tested that we can drive this one here at 200 kilometers an hour for 200 kilometers, so 125 miles an hour for 125 miles, yeah, that's it. So if you compare to the 8-cylinder, then actually the range difference in summertime is not that big. With the 8-cylinder we had about like 700 kilometers of range, here then 650 maximum, but the more it goes on motorway and the higher the speed is and the colder the temperatures are or the lower the temperatures are, the more range difference is there. And of course, if you compare the six cylinder in the BMW X5, then you still have a significant range difference, especially in winter times. But range wise here, because they stepped up the game here at BMW, I think the result is when you think about EV versus petrol, it's not really about the range. It is, and recharging is also good, you know, with the 35 minutes, 10 to 80 percent state of charge. Here, the question is how is your charging infrastructure at home, at work, underway? How is it on your travel routes? How is it on your regular drives every day? And how is your infrastructure where you? usually charge or where you usually can charge and also you know from like sustainability environmental aspect definitely when you pick the x5 get the six cylinder that is from the combustion engine point the best choice and you can easily go electric to me i think really it's all about the infrastructure that's to me the most crucial point because driving experience in the electric vehicle is awesome yes the sound is somewhat missing and I mean, in these uh, you know in these driving modes here, um, and because you also have uh, this you know this this enhanced sound if if you want it uh, that way, um, it is somewhat interesting. Definitely, um, you can also activate or deactivate it. But here again, you see how complicated it is. Like, where is that now? You know. So I have seen it before, but then again, you search for such a long time. Where is that now? You know. So uh, and for some for some things, even if you have seen them already, you think like, where is that now? You know. And I don't know. So I can't find it instantly now, and that's really the thing. Is it live vehicle? I I have no idea. So and then you don't find things. And then you say, whatever you want to say, yeah, whatever, you know. So here in the sports mode, once again, when we start at 100 kilometers an hour, let's accelerate. And 200 once again, it, it starts slowing down a little bit earlier. And here, great handling at high speeds. It's a lot of fun as well. Oh, now hard on the brakes. Yeah, that happens also that they overtake even though they don't have enough speed. So once again on the gas, such great acceleration. And here now, this is a typical situation. Here's now we are finished at 200 kilometers an hour. And now I could use a little bit more speed to overtake this one. Yeah, but I mean, that's totally a German thing to say or to do. Now, once again, hard on the brakes. And here, of course, when we were at high speeds, we can gain back the energy, whereas that's not possible with the combustion engine. As for recuperation, either normal D mode, rolling, and then adaptive recuperation, that means when the car is in front of us, then there's recuperation happening. When there's no one in front of us, the car is just rolling. Or put the shift lever to the back, B mode, and then I lift the foot off the throttle, and we have 
harsh recuperation that is in more the one pedal driving feeling and which one is more suitable to you find out and also find out together with your passengers because when you drive one pedal driving then you have to be very gentle with the throttle both ways pressing it and also releasing it that you don't put extra g-forces then on your passenger the steering form is more likable in the more classic conservative layout i feel so it looks fancy here it's not bad to control at all the steering feel is also good i think just a classic round setup or let's say a, a, a setup with a just flat bottom but then this asymmetric form again you get used to it and it's pretty nice definitely but the more classic setup is to me a little bit better user interface wise as well however here due to this open setup you have an increased traveling feeling but you sit lower in the x5 you have more of this command driving position where here you have more or less a crossover driving position just in relation to the x5 in relation to other vehicles this is still the pure suv feeling definitely uh, but now in a direct comparison you feel a little bit higher in the x5 definitely so that would maybe also be a thing to consider which one is giving you more emotions yeah i mean the combustion engine sound it's not only the sound but also the vibrations these low frequency sounds and vibrations that somehow give you a satisfying feeling and that is missing with the electric vehicles and i wonder why can't they do that here i mean they do have the sound design so why can't it be possible to introduce a low frequency sound why do they all have to sound like spaceships you know yes we got it you want to be modern and you want to be futuristic and stuff but can't you give the choice you know why are you ordering hans Zimmer and giving him millions for designing what is this for you know so why wouldn't you just pick let the customer pick hey today i want the six cylinder today i want the eight cylinder sound today i want star trek spaceship sound today i want okay whatever hans Zimmer sound whatever but you know let the customer pick and then we can maybe also have that combustion engine experience without having fumes at the back that would be something wouldn't it now it will be very interesting to gesture control now it will be very interesting to see how does this one perform in these fast winding corners all right one more time sports mode and let's see the ix here in these winding corners wow that oh, that instant ev acceleration from the get-go is impressive and definitely harsher sportier than in the x5 acceleration wise out of the corners also very well out of it very nice however i feel it pushes you a little bit more into the corner then wow that rear axis steering is awesome so accelerating out and how smooth the acceleration is that is amazing it does apply more g-forces on your body so the experience i would say is more extreme in the ix and also how linear then this power output is when you get out of the corner that is actually even better and sportier i would say the x5 has in a way the more emotional experience because of the sound it also feels more natural more connected to you whereas the ix is the more extreme experience in the sporty agility sense and more feels like in a computer game you know because the power is so enormous especially from the get-go so yeah i would say the ix then from the figures from the performance actually more impressive especially in the lower speed areas but the x5 delivers a more natural experience because you have no shifting here and the power is immediately there this one here is in a way more seamless you know without any transitions and so on but just if you think about the fun way mm, this is so tough you know here lower center of gravity and 
little bit more weight. Both are so great to ride. Um, so head-wise, you might think, yeah, it does in a way make more sense with the iX. But how the G-forces are applied and how everything comes together as an experience for sport and fun driving, for agile driving, just, you know, from a gut feeling, I would still go with the X5. Not necessarily with the M50i and the V8. I said it earlier, I would be totally fine with the six-cylinder. This is a more natural choice for the X5, I think. So just by the driving experience, both are awesome, definitely. But from, from the gut feeling, I would still go with the X5 um, than with the, you know, like a, like a 40i. And I can't really explain why, or I can't like, you know, yeah, maybe something with the sound and so on, but that the G-Force may, may be a little bit less extreme, that might be something, but it's really a gut decision. You know, and Thomas B is already waiting for me. Now we carry on with our comparison test here and what is my final verdict for today? Well, which one will I take home now? And which one would you take home? Tell me in the comments. As for me, both are very impressive, great driving experience with both vehicles. It's amazing how agile and how sporty they can be, although the weight and the size is so enormous. That's the key to both of these vehicles, definitely. Exterior-wise, a clear winner for me, it is the X5. Interior-wise, from the looks, the, just the visuals, the iX wins it because it's so impressive, this lounge interior. User interface, however, the X5 is my winner on the interior so far, as long as they didn't facelift it the same way they do from the X7. And we can expect, if you watch this video at a later stage, probably we only get the X5 facelift or you have to buy the X5 then in a used way. How well usable it is? Well, a lot of space for both vehicles. The X5 a little bit larger as for the trunk area. Driving wise, so much fun with both vehicles. Performance wise and how extreme it is. The iX is even a little bit better, especially because you have this electric punch from the low speed areas. The more natural driving experience, definitely with the combustion engine, it will be the same with the six in or here with the V8. So you just have a little bit more feeling for the car with the combustion engine, a little bit more emotional. And you know, maybe also vibration wise, just the gut feeling that I feel a little bit more connected when I have the X5 with the six cylinder or with the eight cylinder. I would always go for the six cylinder, it's way more fuel saving indeed, and just fits to the vehicle a little bit better. Adaptive suspension or air suspension, both do a great job. You can also stick with the normal adaptive suspension by BMW that also counts for both vehicles actually. So both great in comfort and agility at the same time. Yeah, but then the question also petrol versus electric. Um, you know, going for the electric vehicle makes sense in a way of helping, you know, that we do the shift away from petroleum use on long term. That definitely makes sense. To me, the key is, do you already have the charging infrastructure at home or and or at work? Then the iX definitely makes sense. And of course, from a sustainability aspect, when it also comes from renewable energy, this, you know, this energy. If you cannot charge at home, then of course it still makes sense in a way to go for the combustion engine. And just from an emotional aspect, from the gut feeling, I would still end up with the X5, then as the 40i six cylinder. If I take more the sustainability and moving away from petroleum mindset, then of course I would more go to the iX, but I would really do that when I have the possibility to charge at home. Beautiful landscape here on Tenerife together with the beautiful sporty SUV, the Audi RS Q8. Do you want to enjoy that here together with us on Autogefühl, your number one resource for in-depth car reviews and your number one community to discuss cars? Today with Thomas and we're going to tell you all about exterior, interior and of course the performance driving experience of this top sports version of the Audi Q8. So please join us now in full HD, full screen and full length. Let's go!
hell. So the front of the Audi RS Q8, really big frame around the grill, honeycomb structure on the inside and then for this area here and also for the side mirrors for example, side mirror caps, you can either get this one here, this dark design package, from the night package, but there's also a carbon fiber style available or a grey aluminum style, so three different styles you can actually get. The Audi Iris Q8 has a specific front axle steering to make it a little bit more precise. AMG also does the same with the um, GLE 53, for example. Then those headlamps, you know, quite slim, nice LED signature. They start with the main unit from LED and optional, you directly go to the matrix LED lights. And here in this case, they also have a black background on the inside to make it a little bit more RS specific. And in this LED matrix trim, you also have the cascading turning indicators here already in the front. That looks really amazing. And of course, we did some night shots for you this time for the headlamp, for the matrix headlamp. So you can see the difference between the normal light and the high beam, front and back and so on. That was really impressive, you know, short um, semi off-road drive. And also we tested it on the road when some cars are facing us because the matrix LED high beam works in a way that when some cars are coming towards you, you can have the high beam activated, but then those cars are still not blinded by the light because <laughs> they save actually some LED spots that the car is not getting blind, but you can still have some high beam and a little bit better visibility. So the visibility with nighttime driving is really exceptional with this car. About 5 meters, 16 foot 4 or 197 inches is the length of the Audi Q8. The Iris Q8 has some bigger spoiler, so it's just a little bit longer from the you know, just spoiler length there. And you can see the design is not this typical SUV coupe design where we have very round shape. It's, you know, still has some angular shapes right there, but also strong shoulders. You have the wheel arches in the vehicle color, which is today here Daytona gray. 22 inch wheels would be standard for the RSQ8. Those ones are the option 23 inch, of course, really mess. I mean, 23 inch wheels. Then you also have optional carbon ceramic brakes and air suspension, adaptive air suspension is standard and it varies in the Vaux, actually nine centimeters, about three and a half inches. So six centimeters up for an off-road mode and three centimeters down when you're driving with higher speed or in the very sporty driving modes, for example. Then again, here those black mirror caps in our design package for today, black frames also around the window. And technology-wise, what's interesting, you have a rear axle steering, which comes standard for the Iris Q8, five degrees across, so different direction in the front wheels at lower speed and about one and a half degrees in the same direction at higher speeds to give some more stability. So at low speeds, a smaller turning circle, more agility then, and on higher speeds then actually, it's more stability when you're driving a little bit faster. So what you're thinking about design, and last but not least, the last two technology details, which are optional, sports differential for the rear axle, optional, and also anti-tilt control, the anti-roll control, that really keeps the car really upright. We'll see more about that in the driving part. A very modern styling at the rear with this light strip that goes all around the vehicle. 
beautiful LED signature here too. And in the lower part, the RSQ8 specific design elements here again with the black design, diffuser in the middle part, and those huge outer exhaust tips. The real, let's say, mechanical ones are on the inside to each. If we take a look at that, if we call that fake exhaust, yeah, I think that's a matter of definition. Yeah, sound-wise, you already heard it in our preview. That was pretty interesting, definitely. So, what's your final verdict here on design? Is it too much or is it right sporty enough for you? And also at the rear, we have those beautiful cascading turning indicators right there. So when you open and close the vehicle, but of course also when you use the real turning indicators. So in general, for the Q8, you have a 3-liter TDI, you have a 4-liter TDI for the SQ8, and then my favorite engine for that one would be the 3-liter TFSI, the turbo petrol engine, 340 horsepower. And today, the top sports version with the RSQ8, 4-liter V8 engine, 600 horsepower, of course, massive, 800 Newton meters of torque, 3.8 seconds to 100 kilometers or 62 miles an hour. By turbo, MHF and cylinder on demand. But I can already tell you right now, I doubt that it will help a lot with fuel economy. It's rather that it helps on paper for the fleet consumption for Audi. But of course, those ones here, are, or these ones, sorry, <laughs> they are not really sold in high numbers, so they don't have such an effect on the fleet um, consumption. But yeah, we have to know this one here will consume a lot of fuel, no doubt. We try to find out later how much exactly. This is the car key. It's quite light and it's indeed premium here with the RS logo. And first, a door closing sound, which is very solid, even though there are no frames around the windows. And other possibility here, there is an option to have a soft close. Ah, magic. Also, keyless entry, of course. Put your hand on the outside or on the inside, then again to open it. Yeah, and there we go. And then you can see here, of course, you know, frameless, that's always a little bit more emotional. And also good when getting in and out of the car in, in narrow parking lots, you know, they can lower the window first and then later on put the windows high again with the key. And then here on the inside with some Alcantara inserts, that's very nicely done. The door pockets are still reasonable. Bang & Olufsen sound system, optional 23 speakers with a great sound indeed. Then there's the RSQ8 entry batch together with the RS steering wheel, perforated, and also here with the RS badge in the lower end. I would recommend the Alcantara steering wheel, by the way. It has a better grip. And then the seats, they come standard as a sports seat uh, with the separated head restraint and with Alcantara on the inside. That's also what we recommend, at least somewhat animal friendly and also sportier and um, cooler in summer and um, warm and winter. Here, those ones are the optional RS sport seat with the integrated head restraint. They look cooler, but the base sport seats are more comfortable, actually. Also here, this quilting, it looks great, but on long term, it's not that comfortable as the normal ones. So sometimes it's better to go for the, let's say, not that fancy looking uh, version if you want the best comfort. However, those ones are still somewhat comfortable, yes, because, you know, we're talking of a, of a high level of comfort. Just talking about how can you get an even higher level of comfort. Here in our seating position, very good still. 1 meters 86 or 6 of 1, still some headroom left. Although this one here is the one with the panoramic roof. You can also get it without, depending on your like. Steering wheel up and down in an electric way. The only thing here with this vehicle is that, although it is the RS version, so many things are still optional that can get very expensive. Seats also electric here, up and down and so on. So a lot of different functions. And again, you know, you can find a very good comfortable seating position. You feel, let's say, 
somewhat like in a normal SUV, although this one is like a really high-end sports version. And that's also why I would recommend this one here, if you compare like, you know, with the Lamborghini Euros or something, you can still feel like you have an you know, everyday suitable vehicle, you know. Interior overview with the horizontal stress and wrapped tightly. This huge black area here, yeah, you can argue about piano lacquer, like, but what's cool, the Quattro logo and also some other parts are really nicely illuminated with the uh, you know, ambient lighting. I also have some night shots there for you and you already saw them in the interior intro. That's really a very cool thing. Other than that, it's a very clean interior, all with the screens. 12.3, 10.1, 8.6 inch. So, and then they also interact somewhat together. we we'll soon take a look at that, but mostly with touch just this volume knob is still a real knob, but everything else is basically done with touch. Only at the steering wheel. On the left side you can control those digital instruments, zoom more details to that. You now you can switch around the views and so on. And on the right side of the steering wheel you can control the volume and also the RS mode button. And there you can pick two different RS modes. You can preset yourself. We'll also go into detail of that very soon. So what's your first impression here? Other than that, in the lower console, you have the cup holders, opens like this, they are also adaptive. And then there's this armrest where you can lift it up and have some more USB supplies underneath. And inductive charging pad because Apple CarPlay also works now wirelessly. Those virtual instruments are really fancy. You can also have the GPS view in there and zoom in and out. You can change the whole view if you want it a little bit bigger. So depending on your needs and what you like. And here the special RS view right there. Brum, 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 brum. <laughs> so, and then the RS mode when it's activated, you can also see it here and it also changes a little bit of the whole system. Oh, here for example in the RS2 mode I've set this one. The head-up display is not too easy to catch on camera, but I think you get the picture with the speed, allowed speed and also the special RPM meter here with the RS model and even some um, temperature dials. Well, you can also individualize that if you want to have some other information on there. Now to the screens, it's really fancy, especially the GPS when you have this satellite view and here at Pico del Tede, uh, so it's really beautiful here on Tenerife, so there it is. That's the volcano mountain and wow, what a visualization you can see. Soon we're going to pass into the, you know, this uh, second caldera, so wow. This, you know, the whole Canary Island of Tenerife. Really beautiful. This is La Palma, by the way, also a very beautiful island. Um, La Gomera, and then it would be like in this direction to Spain. So that's definitely pretty fancy. And then you can always go back to where you actually are with this hotkey. Then the phone integration in Apple CarPlay mode, like this, the integration. So it's also all the way over the screen. The sound system is, um, I mean, is actually amazing. So this is the B&O sound system, 23 speakers. I have set the 3D sound surround all the way and it's such a crystal clear 3D surround sound. It's one of the best on the markets. It's wow. I, I could stay in here um, and listen to music all time. It's really amazing. Then let's go back to this, the main menu and you go to left and right, right there. And then in this car menu, you have this special RS monitor. We you know we all see the L2 at the moment. Tire pressure loss indicated, temperatures and uh, G meters. Well, and then when we use the drive select, actually here, normal driving modes, but here you rather use the RS modes and then you can preset them. And drive system suspension steering, you can set to different settings. And here at the moment, I have said that the RS1 is a little bit more sound, but everything else a little bit more balanced. And in the RS2, actually, even sportier. And then also the ESC will be drawn back and so on. And then you can also, you know, activate it a little bit better while driving. So very interesting then in together, you know, playing together with this RS mode at the steering wheel. Well, the lower screen usually stays for the temperature. So you can um, slide like this or click. Or you can also... You know, I think sometimes the engine needs to be on for that when you use the voice command. If you wish to use the online yes, sometimes service, have to activate it first. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, accept it. Let's try it again. 
Set temperature to 22 degrees. I'll increase the temperature to 22 degrees. So that's also possible because using this while driving is sometimes a little bit complicated. So the voice input would be one possibility, definitely. Heated steering wheel is available here. That's pretty cool, for example. And sometimes there's also, you know, playing together with those systems here. You can use the voice input. It's not a natural one. Um, but however, here when you are in this GPS mode, destination the lower screen jumps to the keyboard or you can also write buttons in here or maybe you can even oh was it a pentagram even <laughs> or you can uh, like um you know like a arona or something you can type it in the oh, yeah that was a little bit favor you know you, you get the picture and then again voice control for that oh it's not the natural voice input like with mercedes or bmw not they're not quite there yet but it's already quite well usable what a beautiful sunset here on Tenerife in the south of the island. You maybe know with the Canary Islands in the northeast where the Passat winds are getting caught. It's quite often rainy, cloudy, colder and in the south of all those islands it's always like dry, well, not always but usually warm and dry and so on. That's why we're also in the south at the moment. So and um, in the rear, I was a little bit stuck here. Why well, that was... Well, I don't know, it's like a little bit as the glue door would be gluing a little bit to that. Strange. Um, then here on the inside, also again frameless. And you can see here those shades, they can be lowered electrically. Oh, very fancy. Also some fancy Alcantara on the insert here. And then you can see it doesn't have a big middle tunnel. Well, the, it's a high SUV, so you have a lot of space here on the, uh, in the rear. And that's actually quite cool because that proves again my point. It's a very sporty SUV, but still fully capable for everyday driving life. And if I test it right here, it's such an easy entry. I still have plenty of legroom left and the seating position is also up right here. Still some headroom right there. And it's better than with one of the sports sedans. So it's just more comfortable here. And you can also vary this back part here, put it back or forth again. So you can find a very nice seating position. You can even put this bench forward for more trunk. And even in that way, I could still sit here and have more trunk. So you can vary that depending on your needs. And from here, I also have a good view to the windscreen. But of course, also to our beautiful sunset for the day. Look at that. It's almost gone right now. But of course, we are always filming for you. And in the middle console, you have those temperature gauges if you like it's an option of course heat heating and the lower part also two more usb supplies and the armrest looks like this also with some adaptive cup holders so what about the trunk space here of course you can also see this you know illumination right there very beautiful in the evening sun and the cover of the trunk is shot at the moment and when i open the electric hatch it automatically raises up and when i close it again it automatically closes and I love that. That makes everyday trunk life so much easier. This is about 600 liters up to 1750 liters. When you push it all the way through, you have to flip the seats from the, you know, from the rear, from the rear compartment, not from the trunk. And then you can have this maximum loading space of yeah, almost two meters. The normal trunk length here with the seats up is about a meter. And then here also about a little bit more than a meter in width and you are just somewhat limited here but it's still okay i mean it's like 40 centimeters at the lowest point under the cover and then here you even have about 80 centimeters so i think you can still very well use the vehicle the only thing you know it's quite a pity here just you can have no dimension rather again i have to go around to flip the seats then with the lever where I also control the back part of the seat. So, yeah, here yeah, and then they are pushed right through and that's the maximum setup then. Welcome to Thomas' active driving lounge. I set to the RS mode two and we are uphill here, but let's just accelerate a little bit to see and also hear the sound. <laughs> Holger's <I was> like, <laughs> so uh, 
yeah, that was like 94 kilometers an hour or almost 60, <laughs> Holger still laughing, 60 miles an hour uphill. That was an uphill acceleration. <laughs> yeah, um, not sure when we experienced that one in an SUV. Mm. Well, it didn't feel so much SUV alike. Pretty interesting. And we have dry road conditions here at the moment. So we can also go in the sportiest mode. In I've said the RS modes in a way that the RS1 mode is like already a little bit sportier and that the RS2 mode is then even sportier. And that's where we're in at the moment. So the stability control is also drawn back, but we still have an all-way drive. So we have a lot of traction when accelerating. And there's also still some you know, stability control left. But of course, there's no intention from us here to do some power drifts or whatever. That's also hardly possible with this car. It's also a very heavy car still. Uh, so we have to bear that in mind. Um, considering we have also the heavier engine in the front, do you feel that also? Well, the six cylinder does feel a little bit lighter to drive on the one hand, but then we have all the technology features built inside here, like the rear axle steering, which comes as standard. Then this rear differential lock, which is optional, and also um, the anti tilt control. So, and you really feel that, uh, especially here now in this you know, sports mode where the Air suspension is also set on a stiffer tone, so now when there's some you know uneven um, you know, bumps on the road and so on, you feel that a little bit more. But this car, and especially in the sport mode with the anti-tilt control, I mean, it doesn't lean at all to the sides, so it really feels like driving a low-seating sports car. While we're passing Arona here now, by the way. Brian and Thomas B were here recently with the Seat Arona. So this one is the city here now where the Seat Arona got its name from on Tenerife. Very interesting, right? So <laughs> a little autogefühl uh, car industry trivia here just on our way. So just in a very little town and the inhabitants here were actually really, really happy that they're world famous now because of a car name. <laughs> Pretty interesting story. So back here to, to the car and Again, you know, it's so good in, in the just, you know, slalom-like thing. And the steering also is so crisp and precise. Really love it. It's so progressive. I can keep my hands on the steering wheel all the time. Don't have to grab around. Um, yeah, every single, every small command is being transported to the road. It's really a flawless steering experience, both for comfortable steering and actually for a very sporty steering. So that's really cool. Switching um, over here to the GPS now because of the turn left. But I also see it here in the display. There's also the head-up display, of course, where I have those special performance gauges here at the moment. I also see the coolant temperature, temperature for example. Um, so a lot of information you can get additionally here also with the RS models. And when I'm here now in this aesthetic part, for example, I can deactivate the RS mode and steering wheel. It goes just back to the normal mode. And it's really helpful in this case because otherwise the driving modes you might remember are down there with the drive select. Yeah, and that has always been some kind of a hassle to switch it around while driving. So it's really easier to have the driving mode button here. You know that, for example, Porsche does it here within, you know, Mercedes or AMG recently with this turning knob here. So because you can easier access it at the steering wheel. And now in the normal driving mode, it's more comfortable again. The air suspension is also still comfortable. It is set on a stiffer tone, yes, than with the normal models. But yet again, it is somewhat softer. Softer than, you know, with the, um, like some super, super sports cars or so on. You can still live with that. You can still drive it in everyday driving life. Even though we have 23 inch wheels mounted here. Yes, if you go for smaller wheels, they will deliver you more comfort. So I would always advise you to go for that. So not for the maximum wheel size, but still, I think it's a good decision that this car is still capable of being a primary everyday driving life car. We have some sports car, and I really think, you know, AMG, for example, I mean, if you like that, they go quite often no compromise. They make the suspensions really stiff. If you prefer that, you know, then just, you know, go for the AMG. But if you want more comfort, I think the sport models by Audi and BMW 
offer you more rest comfort even in those very sporty models than the Mercedes AMG does. But again, there's nothing where you can say that's good or bad, it's just a matter of, um, of preference. I can just present that to you and then you can make up your own mind as for that. So now uh, we are on our way up to the Teide mountain, so it's the highest mountain in Spain then, because it belongs to Spain here, even though it's in the middle of Atlantic, and rather you know it's close to Morocco. And we're going up there to have some more beautiful shots and so on. And of course, the road up here is also really cool. And of course, with this V8 power, 600 horsepower, at any time you can get that. However, if you're in the normal driving mode here, you hear not so much from the engine. Actually, it remains pretty silent. There's also this additional exhaust mode, which is already activated, for example, in my RS mode one. Putting that to that one here at the moment, especially in the low speed areas where the rear axle steering is going across with the front wheels up to 5%, you really feel that the car is faking a shorter wheelbase and it feels more agile. That's really cool. It, it really feels amazing and again, keeping it pretty upright and stiff but without being too stiff, it's really a flawless driving experience and although it's not a small vehicle, it feels smaller and more agile than it appears to be. So this RS mode one, set the exhaust node and we already have some more dynamic features and <laughs> I just want to go in slalom here all the time. That's really cool. Some other colleagues film here already with that car. And the thing is, even if we're going uphill, um, I mean, we can accelerate it out at any time and the power is just there. Um, of course, it's always a little bit about shifting up or down. So we can go to the S shifting mode and then in the S shifting mode we're already in gear lower and then we can for example we exit out the corner here we don't have to wait actually to you know for, for the car to shift down or something <laughs> what the hell also sound wise yeah um hmm. <laughs> yeah um I, I just, you know, to mention it, I really love electric vehicles. I really love them. And of course, like, acceleration wise, but wow. <laughs> this one's really interesting. I mean, we're going uphill. It's like, it feels like um, we're not going uphill at all. Oh, this was really tight, that corner. A little bit understeering. There you feel, of course, the weight of the car. But I mean, wow. And our luggage in the trunk always says, thank you, Thomas. What the hell? Uh, did someone still like, oh, I need Lamborghini Euros. Uh, I don't really need it. And I can also shift back myself using the shifting pedals here. I mean, I'm always going uphill here like we would be in a Mazda MX-5 or something. Olga, you're still alive? Yeah. <laughs> Holy moly. I'm not, I'm not even sure if I should still keep on commenting or if I should just leave you guys like for a minute or something with that, with the sound and the beautiful landscape. So rear axle steering is helping me really a lot. That's really cool. And yeah, that power delivery is, um, wow. That's really amazing. The question is always, when can you actually really drive that? When do you have the situations like that? And of course, I mean, going uphill now and really using the power, the fuel economy is um, just astronomically. You can change the views uh, here in the digital instruments. You know, deactivate the RS mode and <laughs> that guy uh, driving the, the forklifter. Oh, he's like, why don't you turn up the car? You know? Yeah, because I'm driving slow in the city. He was like, why don't you show me the exhaust sound? Yeah, you should probably watch out the fuel. Then you can hear it actually, because in the city, I always keep it slow and calm because that guy is maybe car enthusiast, but maybe some others are here not. And then it's like, 
crazy guy here testing his exhaust right here in my city. What the hell? So, and now I'm still searching for my consumption meter. Yeah. Sometimes it's a little bit complicated in, in those digital systems here to find that everything. But, you know, what I found earlier is like, even if you keep it really steady, at least 12 liters more kilometers, more like 12, between 12 and 15. And so you won't get any more than 20 mpg, be it US or UK mpg, maybe UK mpg, a little bit more than 20. But um, when you then use the performance just a little bit yeah then you rather go like um, less than 20 mpg so um, you have to bear that in mind that that all definitely comes with the cost and then from calm back to the RS mode again all the speed limit has changed here once more interesting conditions are also against the Sun and with the Sun driving and driving once more S-shifting mode, and then when I'm in the S-shifting mode, I don't even need the um, the manual pedals because it's really like uh, <laughs> the drive is so effortless and the torque is always there. As for the torque, I really can compare it to an electric vehicle because mostly only in the electric vehicles we have like this flawless torque run, you know, without you feel that like the power. Oh, it might be. I, overtake before the overtaking is forbidden, like here now. I know that always a lot of driving school teachers are watching car reviews and then they're commenting like, you didn't drive properly at 23 point, what are they? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I really try to keep good compromise because you cannot do it right for everyone, you know? I always, you know, there are always people that come in, Thomas, you drive too fast. And I was like, Thomas, you drive like, an, like my old grandma, you know? So. You never can make it right for everyone. I really try to keep it between, you know, the speed limits or everything between the law and when I'm allowed to, then also accelerate it out a little bit that we also have some excitement. But I mean, um, clearly we are not missing any excitement here today. So yeah, that was already something, you know. And I think um, that also speaks for the car in a way, um, especially when you're with changing the driving modes and so on. You can really have both. So sometimes we can have only the sportiness or only the comfort, but here you can almost drive it like a normal Q8 and enjoy this great comfort, upright seating position and so on, really cool. And when you need the power or when you want to access the power, then you always can put in the RS mode and can hammer it all the way through. And yeah, that was really something um, <laughs> So if you if there would be Lamborghini badge right here on the steering wheel, everyone would believe that you know instantly, instantaneously. Of course, this is also a very very expensive car. So like when well, you have a base Q8 with about 70k US dollars or euros, and this one here then almost double in the starting price, so like 130,000, and I have some uh, overtaking here. It's just <laughs> one person on the throttle and everything is like, whoosh, and it's gone. And then with some extras and so on, like 150, you can even break 160K or something. So it will still be less expensive than Lamborghini Euros, yes, but of course the pricing is still somewhat ridiculous. But they put the prices in a way because they don't want people, like more people to buy the car. The car only makes sense for most of the buyers when not so many people are actually able to, to buy the vehicle. I'm really also happy with the with the base Q8 is already driving in a very sporty way and it's a lot of fun, like agile driving wise, you know. Um, this one of course then with the sporty approach as for the suspension, the big difference is of course the engine. So you maybe have the experience <laughs> from um, like normal engine variants when going a little bit downhill what we have here from acceleration where we're going a little bit uphill remember like all the time we've been doing this driving party now we were going uphill and you always have to keep that in mind because that's not going uphill i mean it's like <laughs> going forward like a rocket so um yeah that's definitely very interesting so wow very cool and sporty ride great sound performance as well 
awesome as for the steering experience. Um, definitely one of the best handling SUVs I have experienced so far. Nürburgring Nordschleife lap record like 7 minutes 45 or something, 42, 7 minutes 42, something it was. So be, 42, I think. Yeah, so below 8 minutes. So um, fastest SUV, in, uh, at least in this segment. Um, 305 kilometers an hour, top speed, that's like 200 something, 200 miles something. Uh, don't know the exact calculation now. So, I mean, really crazy figures. Hardly anyone will ever use the true potential of this vehicle, other than you know the a race driver or driver on a Nürburgring Nordschleife. Yeah, um, I mean, of course, it will be more realistic than. And that's also my advice for you today, because you know most people watching this review will be interested here here in this vehicle. Have a little bit of fun with our review. And then maybe end up buying a normal Q8. And that's totally fine. It will be more than enough. Your normal Q8 is already a lot of fun. It's a better compromise, of course, price performance wise. Also, sporty comfort wise. Um, performance, you will have more comfort with the normal Q8. And you can also tune into our, our uh, 3 liter TFSI Audi Q8 review. I will also link that in the video description. So, also happy then later to see you right there. Um, because that's definitely the, the Q8 version I would actually recommend. And um, yeah, I mean, it's always good to have different engine versions, then you know how, I mean, how is it a little bit different in the performance and so on. But most of the time, the manufacturers are doing those top sports models also like just for a marketing approach and then people will end up buying the normal version. But again, that's just fine and you probably will be even happier with the normal version in most driving situations unless you're on such a road you can accelerate <laughs> and listen a little bit to the sound um, yeah but maybe in future it will also be um, possible when we have some electric vehicles or something that we can put that sound in I always wonder why no one has done that yet like just for the for the interior sound so and now We'll have some more winding roads actually. And I would just close this driving part for you with, without any talk, just some driving, enjoying the landscape, some sound, some sporty riding. So, hope you enjoyed this driving part and stay with me just a couple more minutes here for pure auto gefühl. And now to our conclusion for today, here still from above the clouds. Really beautiful to be here. Well, about the Audi Q8 in general, already as a base version, and I would recommend for the best price performance deal, the 3 liter TFSI, it is a quite sporty SUV, but which is still combining comfort and sportiness, you know, in a very nice way. And the Audi Q8 in general also, at least to me, is a little bit more beautiful than those very, very round shapes SUV coupés. But that's of course also a matter of preference. The RS Q8 adds of course more sporty details. Looks a little bit more aggressive but not too much over the top I think. Interior build quality is really great as we know from Audi. Yes but considering now 2019 or well, when you most watch this review will be 2020. 
yeah, it's really lacking a lot of animal skin alternatives. They have to be more sustainable on the interior. You can at least get some Alcantara, especially if you stay with the base seats, which will also be more comfortable. Touchscreen using concept, it's easy manual structure, but what's really helpful that you can activate the driving modes here, you know, <laughs> with this RS bo uh, mode button at the steering wheel, that was really helpful. Driving experience wise, I mean, <laughs> that was, you know, really amazing. So much power, so effortless, and a really great sound. So, even if you, you know, think about some environmental aspects, yeah, it's really critical with this car, definitely. But when you then you know, get the petrol head on the other shoulder. <laughs> yeah, that was a lot of fun, definitely. Still, you have to bear in mind that this is really very high in the fuel consumption. They try to do something, you know, with the mild hybrid concept and also with the cylinder on demand, but it doesn't have such an effect. If you use it in normal driving situations, it will have better fuel economy than we're going uphill in the winding corners. But still, you'll be better off than with the three liter six cylinder, definitely for the over fuel, you know, overall fuel economy. This one here, more a marketing car to show you like that's maximum possible and that it has, you know, no reason to hide behind the Lamborghini Euros, you know, in no way performance wise and also from the agile handling. And still, the Iris Q8 was still suitable for everyday driving life as for the comfort. Not really suitable as for the consumption. But for the comfort, definitely yes. So, quite a flawless, sporty experience, although it is quite a big SUV. Two of the top premium SUVs fight it out. The BMW X3 recently facelifted against the Mercedes GLC in the all-new generation here with Thomas Nautical for you in 4K full screen, full length. Let's go. The X3, well, it's been there quite a while on this generation, but with the facelift, new front grille here, vertical fins, really strong styling. This also has the M Sport package. So we have the black accentuation in the low part and a stronger intake right here. Both have LED specs. You can get different LED specs and interesting how they have totally different signatures here for the LED. The GLC also in the comparable AMG line today. That means also sporty air intakes right here. And it now also comes with this micro star pattern, a really beautiful feature. So to me, from the front, they're both very beautiful. It's just different design philosophy. What's your take? Tell me in the comments. With 4 meters 72 or 186 inches, the new GLC has grown a little bit if you compare it to the predecessor. And now it's basically at the same length like the BMW X3, just a centimeter difference. And the design language is completely different here, especially the GLC, more this, this round shape here overall. Interesting sidestep. They not only look cool, but also serve aerodynamics. But you might get your, you know, you know, trousers dirty or something when they are dirty as well. 19-inch wheels, winter tires, comparable also to 19-inch wheels, winter tires for the BMW. We also have painted wheel arches in the vehicle color, both white here today, a great comparison for sure. M Sport Pack means M Batch here, and here also this, um, you know, this breezer element, because in this case it's not a real air breather, just a design element. And then we have here also black around the windows. And you can see the difference in design language once again, where you have more curved in, more angular features with the X3. The question is, which one do you prefer? I think both are beauty in themselves, I have to say. Front was both, you know, very appealing. Side, I think, yeah, that's a little bit more, you know, angular, sporty siding. I would prefer the X3. But what about the rear? In the rear, we can see big design differences. Here with the GLC, more this round shape raindrop design, I would call it. New style for tail lamps and in lower part. Out of crew, fake exhaust police alert because these are clearly just visual tips. With the X3, a more rectangular design, a sportier approach with the recent face it, also new tail lamp design here. This is a very cool thing and really always tells you, hey, this is an X3 that you can also distinguish it against the small brother, the X1 or something. With the M Sport Pack, you also get the black accentuation in your lower part, a diffuser style, and these are real exhaust and in this case. Which one is the favorite for you in the rear? Tell me. Acceleration figure, by the way, just a little bit over six seconds for both, but difference in, on, on the US market won't be that much because of the emission rules in the European Union. 
This is a little bit detuned, so there is then a bigger difference in acceleration. So the GLC, a little bit quicker, a little bit more horsepower here with the spec GLC 300 against the X-Drive 30i. And the very interesting technology detail is the rear axle steering up to 4.5 degrees in the opposite direction than the front wheels. This comes together in the package with air suspension and the air suspension and the rear axle steering this is actually special to the GLC, the X3 does not have it, just a normal adaptive suspension. And the cool thing is here, with the rear axle steering, it reduces the turning circle by about a meter, because this here goes 4.5 degrees in the opposite direction. Isn't it funny that in the key fob comparison here, the Mercedes, again, all the way round, central shape, and the BMW more angular shape, so the design on the exterior is also reflected in the key fobs. I like that actually. Here, Mercedes door closing sound, actually quite solid. And then inside of the doors in the new generation, it's all about the looks definitely. Therefore very sleek and also clean. But then again, functionality wise, this one does not get feedback anymore with controlling seat. One button design here for seat heating and memory function. So visually it looks cool at first then, but when you look closer then, Maybe I even prefer the previous generation, but the ambient lighting integration is also here, also around the air vents. So the Mercedes interior is more really about look here, what we got, more this wow effect. AMG line means also the horizontal spokes at the steering wheel. And in this case here, there is an animal skin spec on the seat, but there's a lot of Artico, for example, the high grade leatherette available also for the Mercedes, they have good choices there. Seating position here in the GLC, I would say it is fairly comfortable, yes, but I wouldn't say it's ideal for tall people. So I think the seat ergonomics is not top of the game. So when you're tall, you feel like sitting more on the seat than in the seat. However, just the cockpit around you, around you that is more caging you in actually. So not too much space, Above your head, it's okay with 189 or 6 foot 2. But overall, seat ergonomics, I think the GLC will not win today. You won't get back pain or something, but I think Mercedes has to work on the ergonomics. Interior setup with the Mercedes here, everything very central with these round lines. Nice wood insert, but a lot of high gloss black here. But I really like the air vents as for the illumination. But here, that's again seen it with the C class. It's not straight, you know, they're not like, you know, they should be like this, but yeah, build quality wise here uh, on the inside, just these knobs, not that ideal. And the temperature is always controlled in the screen right here. Yeah, um, so no real dials as for that. But it has also here a lot more interesting features. Here, for example, in this off road view, we can also go to this off road camera and then we have a see through bonnet. The image is being built up and now I can see what's going on underneath, not with the live feed. The live feed is around, the feed underneath is then basically built up by the live feed before and then I can exactly see what's underneath. So that's a very cool feature. Here once again close up how I control the temperature and the main infotainment system. This is the map. It's somewhat also responsive, yes. And then you can go to the main menu like this. Good overview actually at the Apple CarPlay or Android Auto is also then available as the wireless. Only thing that is cool here with the vents, you have this feature that the air vents turn red or blue depending on the color changes. Digital instruments, but we can also see the consumption, 9 liters, 1 kilometers for the GLC, 26 mbg US, 31 mbg UK they would be. And then here we can also for example have full screen GPS map, car internally though. Or for example, this great off-road gauge. This is, yeah, the most fancy one for sure. And you also get a head-up display. How does it work on the steering wheel? You slide here, for example, for the volume. It looks clean and fancy, but for controlling it, always better to have a feedback. There is some kind of feedback when you press this here. But you see here, it's like one button fits it all, basically. So one button, but then different capacitive areas. Mm, this middle console here is full of high gloss black, so yeah, not my favorite one. Underneath you have cup holders, they are not that much securing the bottles though. Then I here, for example, have a cable um, connected because in the front you have two USB C chargers. And I always like this split opening here for the armrest with more charging underneath. Now to the rear. Same design here, of course. Inside of the doors also interesting because they use a lot of 
you know, also here like leather red material, soft touch everything and looks cool from the ambient light integration. Lacroom, however, when I'm driving here as a tall person, barely fits actually, so not that much legroom. It works with the recess here and headroom is actually no problem. It's decently comfortable but also kind of stiff from the seats. Looking forward to the comparison to the X3 and in the middle part you can also sit but very limited also as for the legs. So if you go compare it also to the GLB brother by the way has approximately the same length but just has more space on the interior. The GLC is more this upmarket SUV in the Mercedes lineup and also you know with more power and more luxury features uh, and so on rear access steering whereas the GLB is more like this family space on the inside. But what about the comparison here GLC versus X3? This will also be very interesting here for the rear. Switching to the BMW door closing sound also solid maybe a little bit better probably then inside of the doors also soft touch material also clean design and so on. Here with real haptic feedback for the seat control directly at the seat actually and the seat itself also available now here or it's a standard thing perforated sensor tech and this is you know also with breathability great quality and also animal free. This one also the M Sport steering wheel here. Steering heating control is right here with the GLC you have to use the voice command or it's just combined with the seat heating actually. Seating position somewhat comparable. I feel that the BMW X3 gives you a little bit more SUV driving position and the GLC that's more or less more crossover-ish. Here you also have a little bit more space with the middle console and the seat itself you sit a little bit more in the seat actually so maybe a little bit better but I think for BMW seats the X3 doesn't have like the best ergonomics but it's still good. We are really comparing good and good definitely. In this segment here, I think ergonomics wise, the Volvo XC60 would be the best one and the Lexus NX is also very good as for the seat comfort. But overall, I think maybe like a slight, but just maybe a tiny advantage here for the BMW X3 from the position. And well, headroom, hardly comparable here because this one is not equipped with panoramic roof and then we have a lot more space, but you can also get one for that. Interior overview here with the X3, well, you feel it's not as sensual, not that modern, not like, oh, screaming out, wow, look at that, like in the Mercedes GLC. This one more drawn back, more conservative, nice brushed aluminum. Since the facelift, you also have a bigger screen here in 12.3 inch, but here difference is with the GLC, we had this huge vertical one, here the more horizontal approach, so really large difference indeed. The question is what is better? What I do prefer in a way is to have a manual climate knob still with you know some haptic feedback and some interaction with the vehicle. As for the infotainment system here, the map is also somewhat responsive and this is the CarPlay integration also once again via touch or also control it from below. Car internal map then on the middle part in this OS 7 generation, not yet possible with, with CarPlay and Android Auto Maps. So you see here, this is more simple and you don't have so many possibilities like with the Mercedes. Steering wheel buttons, to me, cooler here with the BMW because you can really press them there, individual single buttons. Yeah, I mean here, the manual climate unit, it's cool to have it, isn't it? Yeah, also here the volume knob, good to have a separate manual one still. And sound systems here, the Harman Kardon in the BMW versus the GLC sound from Burmester. The thing is here, the Harman Kardon to me, a little bit more low frequency bass intensive, also good in the surround sound. And the Burmester maybe has a little bit more clearness. So hard to say which one is better. The thing is really more what you prefer. Um, here we would say, they had a bit more wumms. Listen and repeat, they had a bit more wumms. More like, you know, has a little bit more than like bass punch. <laughs> That's, you know, the approximate translation. And the other one in the Mercedes, the Burmester, more crisp clearness. So I guess it depends on the type of music you play. Lower part right here. Ah, this, you know, this can get stuck here at the beginning a little bit, so don't like it that much. But the cup holes are actually better with BMW. They hold bottles a little bit tighter. Inductive charging pad, you'll need this. Um, also connect via cable but here but the thing is that the CarPlay or Android Auto connection is always wireless. 
And with the BMW, you still get a real shifting lever in the lower area. Some do definitely prefer that. And here, this is then this control knob there. Another possibility for the infotainment system, I think it's good to have it, especially while driving. And then we have this armrest here, also very well built, with more space underneath. Also nice build quality here in the rear with soft touch materials, this leather red covering, sensor tech covering for the rear, rear seat doors, and here with this brushed aluminum look. Wow, really cool actually. And then also the seat bench with the perforated center tech. So yeah, looks like a build, good build quality, a little bit more conservative in the styling. It's also the comparable older vehicle. As for the legroom, when I'm driving, you see also not too much space. The recess also works. So yeah, both don't have too much legroom here. I have to say um, here it would also be, I compared the GLC with the internal brother GLB, which had more space on the interior, although the same size. The X1 is smaller than this one here, but has basically the same or maybe even a little bit more legroom. It always has to do with the packaging and these bigger vehicles, they usually have longer hood and so on. Headroom, no problem at all, but this one again also without the panoramic roof. I can't say that any of these here has a big advantage in the rear. Middle seating, um, yeah, it's also a little bit cramped as for the legs, but then it's a little bit softer here. So both work for four tall adults, five just on short tracks, but no clear winner as for the rear. Now the trunk comparison, both used to be at 550 liters in capacity. The GLC now topped up 50 liters. It's now a little bit larger, so 600 liters. And what about the concise thing? So here we have the slider rails on the side. The width here is actually a little bit more than a meter of 40 inches. That's well done. And the length is yeah, also approximately a meter or 40 inches, maybe a little bit shorter. And the height is always very interesting. This is the highest point here at 73 centimeters or 29 inches. The folding mechanism here, at least when you have this one, this possibility, this is awesome, the most awesome. Look at that, I mean, wow. Immediate folding and super clean and flat. And the total length is about, yeah, about 180 or 71 inches. Below here, by the way, a lot of space still at that. Then when we switch it over to the X3, you maybe remember the height with the DLC. Let's compare it here. What do we score? This is higher at like 78 centimeters or 30 inches. So the GLC was ending here. So you have, you know, like more height here. That's very usable. Then below also some more space. Then about the total length because we can also fold the seats um, here in the deck three, of course, but we have to reach over. But then it's actually also fairly easy to do that. A little bit less comfortable total length here. Yeah, I mean, here it's like also 180 or 71 inches. It depends also where it's closing. Usually it's more like here. So yeah, more or less the same. And then here the normal length of the trunk is yeah a little bit shorter here as well, a little bit less than a meter, 40 inches. The width here, is comparable indeed a little bit more than a meter or 40 inches. So a um, little bit more height for the X3, but a little bit more length for the GLC. Overall, both are very, very well usable. This seems to be here more, you know, a little bit more square, especially the opening. As for the engines, main difference is that for the X3, you can get six cylinder petrol and diesel engines. However, this is the four cylinder engine, also a very big bestseller here, the 30i as rear drive or as X drive here with the all-wheel drive, rear wheel bias, 245 horsepower at least in the EU spec, 258 horsepower for the 2-liter four-cylinder in the GLC, GLC 300 also available as rear drive or all-wheel drive and with the new generation of the GLC they set everything on four-cylinders expecting a six-cylinder diesel on the later stage so these are the main differences and the thing is that the excavation figure the GLC is a little bit quicker than the X3 here in this comparable engine spec. And also the plug-in hybrids, they have a lot more range here with this C-Class or GLC platform. Welcome to Thomas's Comparison Driving Lounge. GLC versus X3, starting with the Mercedes GLC new generation, GLC 300 formatic German Autobahn acceleration onto the motorway. Let these two cars pass. You shall pass. And then from 45 kilometers an hour, sports mode. 
Let's go. One thirty. One fifty. Slowly approaching two hundred. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. And almost the plop. 200 kilometers an hour, 125 miles an hour. That's enough here for now. Wind noise is actually quite okay considering this high speed. And here also, with the air suspension in sports mode, it's giving me more feedback. And wow, it's surprising how upright this car is staying. So it more feels like a sedan to drive indeed. Yes, of course, put up, but really stable indeed. And that shows also this air suspension is indeed not set on a very soft note, it's rather set on a stiff note. It's still comfortable, yes, but especially in the sport mode, it rather should enable you sporty driving indeed. For more comfort, we go back here to the comfort mode in the drive select. You do not have to hit it on the screen, you can also you know, like scroll through left and right, so that's at least possible. Responsive net could be a little bit better. Here in the comfort mode now, comfort is definitely fine fine as for suspension but again I talked about this sometimes when I'm driving Mercedes I love it when they have air suspension and having this very soft floaty ride maybe that's too soft for some others I don't know but for me I think it's great when having air suspension but here rather on a stiffer note without losing comfort or something you know in the tunnel look at that ambient lighting I mean this is like, this is like night riding you know here, there, 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 there. Is it too much for you or do you love it? Just tell me in the comments. So I really find it very, very cool. Why not? And you know, also here when you play with the temperature again, that you have the red vents then when you make it warmer, blue vents when you make it colder. Of course, also when I would have green, this the, the standard color, and then the more that make it colder, then it jumps from green to blue, for example. But I have set blue here to the standard color at this moment. I really like the steering input, so it's quite precise and direct. Mercedes steering inputs used to be, yes, natural, but in a way kind of slow. <clears throat> so you had to turn a lot until something would happen. Here they have made it a little bit more, you know, you know more reaction to low degree angle. And this progressiveness I really like. So, in this case then, a big difference to the previous generation. Indeed, this new generation GLC, if you compare it to the previous generation, feels definitely sportier to drive. And then, of course, you have that rear axle steering, which is just, just massive, you know. This is also then when we start comparing to the BMW X3, the rear axle steering, 4.5 degrees in the opposite direction, this is a major advantage indeed when you think about U-turns and also commercially where can where can I show you that? What we could do is actually Yeah, I mean there's there's a fuel station here nearby, so uh, let me just drop it to the fuel station, then I can almost like you know turn around in a circle or something. So it is at low speeds, it turns in the opposite direction. And for example when I get on here now. And you know this not like a vast array, you know, you know but just when I here when I do like this let's take a look at that. So this guy's wondering what the hell is this guy doing there. But here I can it almost feels like I would be turning on standstill, you know. So yeah, no not gonna fool the fuel station. Fool the fuel, yeah. I'm not gonna fuel it up. So Sometimes you think like, you know, like U-turns, you would say like, I can't do it with, you know, with such a big SUV. Yeah, here it is actually possible. This rear axle steering is just awesome. And that BMW doesn't offer it for the X3. Might be something coming up in, in, in an all new generation at some point or, or so. So rear axle steering, steering, really good. Suspension also doing a good job. We can, there's an X5. <laughs> we can head out to the motorway once more and do some more high speed driving and see how the lane changes are at higher speeds. But before that, cruise control, set, assistance systems. So here the 
distance of the car in front of me is being kept, I can activate or deactivate the active lane keeping assist here. At the moment it is activated. And then here you can see the car keeps itself in the lane. This is the blind spot monitor visually and when I put the turning indicator then it also acts acoustically. Here in the settings you can also deactivate the active lane changing assist and then it's actually gone. Yeah, in this case the car is just keeping it up anyway because you see that the steering is turned just a little bit and the corner is going exactly a little bit left. That's astonishing. <laughs> so that would yeah that looked like active lane keeping, although it's not active lane keeping because also uh, from Toxie and you know that, that the wheels just follow the ground. Very interesting. Sportsman one time when we 90 kilometers now, let's go. Very nice sound, right? 130. 50 and 180. Yeah, so let's have around here. Wow, cars being kept in the lane very nicely. Of course, now that we got the assistances, I mean, like suspension is doing a good job, not shaking up the vehicle. Now at high speed lane changing, feels real. Oh no, it wants it speed limit for winter tires. <laughs> To attend, so that's the speed limit they set on the window tires. It feels so calm and collected driving high speed motorway. Here, when we have some waves actually, then the air suspension become, becomes apparent. Then we know we are doing an air suspension. But wow, I mean, how well this vehicle is handling on high speed for an SUV without being like Porsche Macan or something, you know? So definitely confirms the thing switch from previous and this generation that it's way sportier than before and so far it was really the thing when we were looking at GLC versus X3 we could always say yeah you know the X3 is the sportier one whereas the GLC is the more luxurious one and since they made this generation sportier in the drive that doesn't count that much anymore you know um, also remember here it is basically still a Brum, brum, brum. <laughs> it is basically still a rear-wheel driven platform so you can get this one here for example in the US also as rear-wheel drive but in the EU this one will then be um, all-wheel drive in most cases it the hell yeah this sound emulation is also um, telling like hey we're sporty now you know <laughs> very interesting so yeah Indeed, it is uh, more fun to drive. So again, with suspension, steering, rear axle steering and so on, this generation is indeed more fun to drive now. That's definitely a cool thing. And if they want to make it up to BMW, you know, so try to even out that gap, indeed as for the sportiness, they did that. So, and yeah, technology wise is pretty amazing with the rear axle steering. So. These are a lot of advantages that Mercedes has gained now. It also offers that air suspension, then again the price is higher, so it's always pro and con, definitely yes. So the GLC from the driving part here already gathered a lot of pro arguments against the BMW X3, so this might be a very, very close race. Is there anything yet when what we could say on the negative side? Well, to told you on the interior, when driving here, it's not that I would get any back pain or something, you know, so it is comfortable enough. But I still have the feeling also, I've been driving um, yesterday like 600 kilometers in one day. Didn't, again, have any back pain or, or something. But I feel like these seats are a little bit too stiff, especially with the animal skin material. The article that I read will be a little bit softer and you more feel like... Oh, it wasn't wasn't for me. You more feel like sitting on the seat. Oh, what a nice uh, old W123. So uh, you being like, you cannot go into the seat being held tight, you know, so you're more sitting on the seat, like almost like blown off the seat. Just, you know, accelerating out a little bit. Horse traffic here. Um, so I'm not exactly sure if they thought about really tall people for the seats. If you're a little bit smaller and it's no problem probably, but I think that the long-term seat ergonomics at this moment, at Mercedes in general, is not top of the game. And that especially like, you know, Lexus, Volvo, um, Audi is doing that better. 
BMW, sometimes yes, sometimes not. Depends on the car model. What about the X3? And now the BMW X3 in that comparison. Well, first of all, steering-wise, this is very interesting. So it used to be the other way around. But now the Mercedes GLC actually has a more direct steering. That's very interesting, isn't it? Might have also something to do with the rear axle steering option, but not only. Because here also, indeed, I have to steer more in the BMW. So that's a very interesting thing, right? Isn't it? So it's also good in as for steering feeling, and I also prefer it if you compare it to the BMW 3 Series, which feels to me a little bit less natural in a way. But here, I think, yeah, it's totally fine, but surprising that the Mercedes GLC has the more direct and actually sportier steering feel. Just from the whole mm, drive itself, from being in that vehicle here, somehow the X3 feels a little bit more engaging sport here, but just, you know, on a very subjective note, you know what I mean? So, um, that, that whole layout maybe also where Mercedes sends it more to the wow luxurious features here the X3 feels a little bit more engaging but you don't have it anymore this difference that hey Mercedes luxurious BMW sporty because the new GLC generation is also quite sporty so that's a very interesting thing we have the adaptive suspension here in the BMW that's the one they got so both with the optional suspension. Uh, the air suspension in a way can do a little bit more with the GLC. They have set it on a sporty note, or oh, interesting wrap for that A5. They have set it on a sportier note than before that air suspension. Um, at the same time you feel here, the adaptive suspension is also very good. However, due to that air suspension in the GLC, um, it is not less sporty but at the same time it is more comfortable. So also a very good ride here with the X3, no doubt about that, but you feel a little bit more what's happening on the road, whereas that air suspension in the Mercedes is evening the things out. Of course, that's also the thing about going for the options. So one of the key findings already we can say here that when you have like a low spec GLC versus low spec X3, there won't be such a difference, or maybe also a little bit favored towards the X3, but when you go high spec versus high spec and also get all of these optional technology features that the GLC has, like rear axle steering plus the air suspension, then the GLC plays out these technology advantages in that new generation, and then it actually is a better ride than in the X3. So uh, very interesting uh, finding here already right now. Overall, it is also, you can also have it relaxing, even though it is engaging. The engine, of course, power spec-wise, it is somewhat comparable, definitely. You maybe remember how it picked up in the sport mode in the Mercedes. That was actually pretty quick. And what we can do here is also go to the sport mode and put it here to the S-shifting mode as well. So this is then, in this case here, um, like two different uh, things you have to do. And when we just roll a little bit and then just see how responsive it is. Yeah, maybe also quite responsive, but maybe a little bit more, you know, of course takes for the shifting down. So then bang, you get the, the, the big boost. Um, yeah, in a way, maybe that was a little bit smoother with the Mercedes, I would actually say. It will be very interesting soon when we head to the motorway and do the high-speed comparison, how it compares right there. I can always say both drive very, very well. It's really, really hard to pick a definite winner um, in here. Just again, when you think about U-turning and uh, you know parking in and out, there are the Mercedes with that optional rear axis steering is already a winner definitely here going some left and right um, i mean the funny thing is here in that very small degree you see here it doesn't do too much but then when you go some left and left and right in this degree then the x3 gives you a little bit more feeling for the vehicle and although the glc is sporty now indeed the thing is still that the bmw more feels connected it's more like this 
here I always know I am driving the vehicle and rather feel one with the vehicle. The GLC more has this, oh, this is like high-tech stuff and this is really amazing and impressive, but it's rather like I, I am driven by this high-tech vehicle. You know what I mean? And the, that is, you can't really say like, that's good and that's bad. That's more about also personal preference. Both have something. The GLC kind of transports more fascination while driving, whereas here the X3 more transport this mm, more purest car enthusiast feeling. So, and once again, both have something unique. This is really about what is important to you. What is important to me? Maybe I know more about the this decision here. I'm driving at high speed on the German Autobahn. Sport mode and as shifting mode from 50 kilometers now. Let's go. slowing up and 200 kilometers an hour we start a little bit earlier the acceleration here also lane changes at high speeds very well done really stable also not too much wind noises considering the high speed definitely so also very well done it feels also calm and collected definitely and the adaptive suspension here at higher speeds is more comparable than with lower speeds that's very interesting here also, once again, lane change at high speed. Very good feeling for the vehicle. Um, as for, you know, noises and so on, maybe it was even slightly better for the Mercedes. But it really interesting is that suspension-wise, when you're really at high speeds, both are more comparable. When you're here at like mid speeds and low speeds, then that air suspension of the Mercedes is playing um, out its advantages. So there you definitely have more comfort. So the air suspension just more adaptive, more versatile uh, in a way here, there. Um, yes, there's also an adaptive suspension and the comparison will maybe look a little bit different when the Mercedes has the base suspension, that, but that's what we got here comparing high trim versus high trim and here in the tunnel. There is some ambient lighting inside of the doors and also here towards the side area. Looking also quite cool, also in the lower middle console here. But definitely that ambient lighting of the Mercedes is no match for that here when you're driving. For some it's too much, some rather prefer it subtle, but yeah, some find it also cool. The cruise control we have here is also an adaptive one. It set the speed and also the distance to the car in front of us being kept. Um, lane keeping assist here. Um, is more that let's say like this emergency um, um, lane keeping assist it's not as comparable as active as the one in the Mercedes so then the one in the Mercedes is already let's say a step higher as for that elaborate lane keeping assist here once again a little bit more driver focused and that's also a lot of fun here in this Autobahn Ausfahrt it's near the exit of the Autobahn yeah so it's very interesting, you know, so I, I wasn't really quite sure what to expect when comparing these two vehicles. Indeed, um, both have definitely their unique strength. Mm, and I was kind of surprised how sporty the GLC is now. But here, yeah, the X3, it doesn't have this high-tech sophistication focus, but it still has this engaging drive. Let's get now in this corner here. See here, I have to steer a little bit more, but very well outside the corner. All wheel drive here also with the rear wheel bias, then with the BMW. Really hard to say which one I prefer powertrain wise. The Mercedes seems to be a little bit more efficient. So, here, you know, more than 90 years, more towards 10 years or more kilometers. So, that's rather than, you know, towards 20 something plus uh, MPG barely 30 mbg uk so a little bit more better advantage as for the fuel economy for the mercedes one more time 90 kilometers an hour to whatever let's see one 
150, 170. Ah, it feels really nice. It's uh, amazing indeed. I mean, the X3 feels quicker, although on paper the acceleration figures are better for the Mercedes. That's very interesting, isn't it? Hmm. Strange indeed, right? So, but that's also the thing, you know. So it feels it feels quicker and it feels still sportier to drive, just a little more engaging in the handling. Whereas the Mercedes has this, you know, technology shine stuff. Um, and higher speeds here and there, some rattling stuff, I have to say. Um, that wasn't the case with the GLC, so here also small advantage for the GLC. But from the driving itself, again, both great really. Um, here maybe a little bit more fun focus, where we have more tech photo, tech focus with the GLC. Let's sum that up and phew, it's gonna be tough. Which one would I take home and which one would I recommend for you today? It's going to be a tough one. Well, the thing is, from the exterior styling, I really like both from the front. The Mercedes has some cool features like the MicroStar pattern, but the BMW also looks very strong in the front. I really like both in the front. I think this, the design is overall good. But then again, towards side and rear, I think I rather prefer the X3 for more angular styling. This is the automatic closing function, by the way, that the side mirrors also for in the car close itself when I go away from it. Um, so here, more round central styling for the Mercedes, and it carries over to the interior in there. Styling-wise and also ambient lighting-wise, that's what I find very lovely with the GLC, whereas the X3 is more drawn back, more conservative. So this interior of the GLC gives you more experience and more showing off effect indeed. But then again, the X3 has manual climate dials, for example. It also is more simple in a way, you know, and both have something, you know. You can experience more with the GLC, but you can easier use the X3 and both. Yeah, it's, it's really tough indeed. As for the space on the interior, they are not best, you know, they are overall. Their smaller brothers, for example, would have a better packaging overall ratio. In the trunk, also comparable. I would rather say it's more rectangular with the X3. Rear legroom, also quite comparable. And driving wise, well, so far in the previous generation, I would have said, yeah, okay, the sporty experience, X3, luxurious experience, less sporty, GLC. Now the thing is that when you have this air suspension and maybe also set on the sport mode and so on, and they are sportier also from the steering and so on, so the GLC has even this gap. It's not that this one would not be sporty anymore. So that's a major finding also from this review, from this comparison review. Technology-wise, the Mercedes leads it indeed because of that rear axle steering that makes it so much better to use parking in and out. That would be a crucial factor actually, but it's also a very cost-intensive option. Hmm. And of course, when you go for a plug-in hybrid, this one will have a big pure electric range, 100 kilometers or 60 miles and so on. From the, like how engaging it is to drive, I would say the X3 still has like a notch more when you sit down and it's still a little bit like the X3 is like drive me and the GLC is a little bit more command B driven, you know what I mean? So at the end of the day, I think the thing is, do you prefer the styling on one of these, both exterior and interior? And how important is it for you to be a little bit more engaging in the drive? Or are you more focused on the technology side where the GLC just offers more? So sometimes in these comparison reviews, I struggle. Sometimes I say, okay, this is the clear winner or this is the clear winner. But today it's super, super tough. I wouldn't say that there is a super clear winner on either on this one here today. It's real thing is more technology focus and more like showing off or more, a little bit more conservative, more, a little bit more engaging to drive, that is their crucial choice for the day. And also, depending on the market, the GLC in most cases will be a couple of thousand euros more expensive, especially when you go for these technology features. So I would then also look at the pricing. So I can't decide right now which one I would take home. I think I would take maybe weeks really to, to decide and then also look at the pricing. Here again, the MSAs will be more expensive if you take these technology features. Let's, let's take it that way. 
when you compare high spec versus high spec, I think the technology features for the Mercedes GC shine. But when you go low spec versus low spec, then the difference is not that large from the technology thing and then the X3 would have the advantage. This here is the Genesis GV70 midsize premium SUV from Hyundai's premium brand. Well, can it be one of the best midsize SUVs overall? Let's find out, Thomas and Autofuel, let's go. Once again, a very strong design by Genesis here in the front. This one is the sport line with black accentuations in the lower part and also a darker frame around the grill. We'll also soon compare the luxury line and this matte paint here is called Melbourne Grey Matte. So greetings to all our Aussies down under. And the LED lamps, slim integrated here, more than daytime running light. I think design-wise already very well done in the front. And here we have the other color for you, a white vehicle, of course, more color choice available. And this one is also the luxury line. That means more chrome accentuations here upper and lower part. The length is at 4 meters 72 or 186 inches and these here are 19 inch wheels minimum. Maximum goes up to 21 inch wheels. We'll soon check it out with the other car. Once again, a cool styling here for the matte paint. ECS, electronically controlled suspension is standard. So these are the adaptive dampers. An interesting design clue is right here at the C pillar, kind of standing upright. More reminds me of a Mercedes GLE, doesn't it? And then we have this separated window here in the rear. And clearly when you go for a white color, this third window there in the rear becomes just more obvious. But it looks a little bit weird, doesn't it? And there it is, the white vehicle, which kind of looks completely different than the darker one from the side profile. Don't you think so as well? And here then the 21 inch wheels, really massive here for that mid-size SUV segment. And in any case, wheel arches painted in vehicle color. The luxury line here in the rear, definitely a sport look and really modern here with the flat integration of the rear lamps. How it looks like down there, yes, we have chrome in the luxury line, but this is also more about which engine do you have. This one here equipped with a diesel and there is no exhaust pipe whatsoever. It's just really the rear one underneath, but I think that brings a really clean design. Design here for the sport line and petrol engine. You can see here this part, you know, is a little bit more accentuated than with this, you know, checkered structure and then well, auto fuel fake exhaust alloy is present right here because the real exhaust on the inside, the outer tips are fake. Well, the air does go through, but still a case for the auto fuel fake exhaust police. Otherwise, you know, the real design is really cool, I think. By the way, some more colors. This one here is called burgundy. So a very, very dark red. Oh, and what about the strong red one? They really have a nice red exterior color, don't they? And turning indicators, we know it from Genesis already. They're really, really cool. Both hazard lights and turning indicators with this double LED scheme here in the two stripes. That doesn't count for the GV70 in the rear here though, because they are then placed in the lower part. Well, it has a reason. Because when you open that hatch, then they would otherwise disappear. Well, 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 but the German eye discovered this one here, the Spaltmaße, the panel gaps, and look at that here. Not really happy with, you know, how the hood is being bent here in the front. So this is kind of like too big the gap. And then also secondary part. What is this here? You know, this overlapping hoop, hood here in the front. Not sure why they did that in this exact kind of way. Hmm. Luxury line interior. Here it becomes obvious why you should go for the sport line in this case, if we decide between these two. Look at that steering wheel. We know it from the bigger models. It just looks yeah, too traditional, too old school, I think. Here and also with animal skin seats. There in the base model, you can get a beige or black leatherette. So they cover this one definitely, but it will be even more interesting in the sport line to come. And there we go. This steering wheel looks way more likable. Sport design, somewhat similar as we know from the G70. However, there's one big change here. There are still real buttons in the scene, we're glad we have them, but then also some capacitive buttons, but at least it's not all capacitive, so they found still a good mix. And then this would be the other alternative to the pure leatherette seats that are available, these ones here on the sport line. A mix of fabric right here and then leatherette right there. So according to the information, also animal free and they are more breathable than of course, if there's a fabric share. So these are then indeed also seats to go for Pretty cool. But let's not forget the car key. Also here with this remote parking function, by the way, soon more to that. 
And then the door closing sound. Yeah, quite nice. But yeah, beep, 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 beep. Uh -huh. Inside of the doors here, soft touch. Good look, also contrast hitches. And also nice quality here from the buttons and so on. So this looks all really good and also how everything is processed and also the, you know, all the panel gaps here on the inside, really superb. Yeah. When I shut down the ignition, steering wheel comes up, seat moves backward. When I activate the ignition, steering wheel comes down, seat comes forward and yeah, of course the yeah, <laughs> quite obvious beep, 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 something. <laughs> we know it. Um, yeah, it's actually a very nice seat in position. You have a lot of room around you and you don't feel like the huge difference to the bigger GV80. So this one here already feels quite sophisticated. I've also driven the G70, the sedan, the, you know, sister model to this one here. And I found that the difference G70 to G80 is way larger than here GV70 to GV80. Quite interesting, isn't it? So good seating position, nice fabric seats, breathable, one means a six, six with one, enough space left. So, so far, good. Here the interior overview, you can see a very clean design, especially here then, another red dashboard, and then this 14.5 inch widescreen taken from a G80 or a GV80. So there's a major difference also if you compare the sedan brother, the G70 here to the GV70 SUV, where the sedan gets the smaller screen. And here also some more updates. That this is here, this area more modern. Looks really cool designs and I'm really glad they kept the temperature dials here in a manual way. Just the vent strength has to be controlled by the screen, but yeah, I can live with that as long as this one here is still there. So this is kind of like a mix of traditional and modern, I would say. And you still have hard hotkeys here, for example, to access the map. There's also a very interesting screensaver here, of course, and you also have a lower home button to access the main menu there again. Again, the steering wheel, perfect at the sides, and then you can still also have these hard keys here, capacitive button to activate the cruise control, for example. Soon also to these three-dimensional instruments, a little bit more head-up display is available. And here in the lower part, yeah, we can see here, it's an interesting cubby hole, but for the smartphone, but goes really deep in there. So you really have to bury out your smartphone there always. And this is also a very interesting part right here, because you remember in the GV80 or in the G80, this one here is a, this one is completely shallow. You can only do like da, 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 the DJ. And now they switched it to a real knob here. You can actually like use like this. And this is way more practical, so much easier to cruise through the menu. It was said before that maybe you can mistake then the shifting lever here. They are shifting. It's not a shifting lever, it's shifting knob with that one. But I think no, um, because this one is just so much more here and you just use it once or twice. And this one then is also a little bit higher and it feels differently. Um, so I don't think I would mistake this one for that one. Would you? Cup holders are also adaptive. Nicely done. And we have this middle armrest. Could be a little bit better attached underneath. More space. And the digital instruments have a 3D effect, but you cannot see that on camera just with your own eyes. And then the middle contents can be changed. And then we have a head-up display, useful option and yeah, these guys are cleaning a Thomas Blue Genesis G70. Check out that review as well. And by the way, another proof of quality or how these gaps or how these contrast stitches are very well aligned. And then this infotainment system, once again, so much easier to control now from below and so much quicker. Again, the great screensaver, like where you have the transition to the map. However, the software itself, yeah, I mean, it's okay and also better than past ones. Still, you know, with this kind of hook thingy for the pinch and zoom, I don't know what they're thinking, why they are not finally removing that. Um, yeah, and then for example here, seat controls, you have some detailed settings right there if you don't want to do them by the seat themselves. There's a terrain mode available even. You know, yeah, but at the moment it's off, but nice visualizations here for the vehicle. You can also start the car and show you more about that. Here we go, then you have even better visualization for that. And we also have these degree angles and so on. And then the CarPlay integration looks like this. And you still have a map then on the right part because it's so much widescreen actually. And let's listen to that sound system. 
you know, very clear. In the rear, there's also this leather cover for the rear door here as well. And then there's also an advantage if you compare now the G70 sedan. Here you have more legroom because you sit more upright. This exactly fits then. Also headroom-wise, no problem. There's a nice hanger here also for your jackets. However, if you compare to other SUVs in this segment, it's not the most, you know, no, no, not the most plentiful legroom here there is, but it's actually okay. Then the back part of the seat can be adjusted more upright or more to the back. Oh, like really like a sleepy position. Goodbye. <laughs> so that goes really far. There is a huge middle tunnel here, however. So moving in the back here is yeah, quite complicated. In the middle part, you sit quite upright. Also it gets close with the knees. So rather four tall adults and the fifth tall adult is maybe like just for short term. Nice rear climate unit here as well. And also two USBs. USB eight chargers actually, and then in the middle part we have cup holders. They are not adaptive though. The trunk opens here like in the Porsche Macan, and 540 up to 1,680 liters. That's not too much actually because it's not that high. However, you have an even loading sill. The length here of the trunk is 96 centimeters, or about 37 inches, and the total height right here, 28 inches, or 72 centimeters. The width between the wheel arches is very interesting. Yeah, it's definitely a good meter of 40 inches. And you can see here, a backpack also fits here. And well, underneath the cover, the thing is, you know, when it fits like this, it's being kept tight, but this, like, you know, a little bit wobbly. That's the, you know, disadvantage to that. But then you can keep things tight with that. So there's pro and con to that, definitely. But even more interesting is, of course, when we take it out completely. And there's something which is, you know, created in a very nice solution here because here in the front, first of all, listen to that carefully, click. So this one is kind of secured with a click. But when it's open, you can remove the side pads here. And then there's actually really space to store that rear cover. So here we go, change it now, see works. And then we can fold the seats from here. That's also quite practical. One third, two thirds split and indeed folds very directly. And when we then measure the length to the driving seats, it's, yeah, it's almost 180 in meters. That means yeah, some 70 inches overall well usable. And one of my favorite features when you approach the vehicle, this functionality was introduced with the previous generation Hyundai Tucson here. You just wait a little bit, it beeps, and then it automatically opens without you needing to make a foot kick or something. And it's really practical when you have heavy items in your hand and opens quite, yeah, fairly wide. I can stand underneath it with one way A6 or 6 of one and child safety test. Let's see. Yeah, also proven. And of course, beep, beep, beep. <laughs> And now to that remote parking function. So even if the car is already closed, you always have to hit the close button again. And then directly after that, the right one in the top, then maybe heard it, the car has started. And then let's just imagine it's like in a very tight parking spot. You can move it actually with the key. Okay, there we go. I had to be a little bit closer to the vehicle. And now it's rolling forward. See here, when I'm, when I'm getting too far away, it automatically stops, so I have to be closer. Come on, here we go. Come on, buddy. Yes, good boy, good boy. And not goodbye. Uh, yeah, good boy, from, from good boy to goodbye now. <laughs> also works here, reverse, by the way. The GV70 gets the more modern engines than the sedan brother, the G70, here with more displacement. So that's an interesting trend. 2.5 liter four-cylinder turbo engine with 250 or 300 horsepower in this spec then here, 6.1 seconds in the acceleration, or the 3.5 liter V6 and with 380 horsepower and 5.1 seconds, so a second faster. And then there's also a 2.2 liter diesel. Oh, look at that. These firefighters having a great time with their vintage vehicle. <laughs> Obviously taking some photo. 
So let's go here, Thomas's driving lounge with the Genesis GV70. This will be very interesting. Why? First of all, first time for me in this vehicle. Then, how is it rating against Mercedes GLC, Audi Q5, BMW X3, for example? And how does it rate against the bigger Genesis GV80 SUV? And also comparing into the G70 sedan, the platform brother. So actually then three different very interesting aspects and of course overall how good is it you know in this segment and first I have to say exterior wise great styling interior wise good build quality and also the user interface is still somewhat classic in a way that we can easily access a lot of the functions and now driving wise yeah the platform itself feels quite agile and light. There's a big difference to the GV80 definitely. But the thing is that from the interior, you know, from the perceived interior space, it doesn't feel so much smaller. This is a very interesting key finding for me here already. So when I compared really the G70 versus the G80, so mid-size sedan versus their big sedan, huge difference already from the interior and also driving wise huge difference but here then the differences gv70 versus gv80 are not that large as you would might expect and this one here also has a lot of modern features and of course has the same infotainment system for example this one has the more modern engines the bigger engines the more powerful engines and yeah in a way of course this one feels more agile than the bigger suv and also for an SUV, it feels quite agile. With their big vehicles, Genesis rather goes to a, you know, very comfortable luxury approach here. And with their mid-sized vehicle, they definitely they definitely feel sportier and more oriented in the sporty directions. Also, if you compare it to the German competitors, so their G80 and GV80 more against Mercedes E-Class and Mercedes GLE, where I feel that this one here is rather against the Q5 or the BMW X3 from you know the, the basic philosophy. Cruise control set here at the steering wheel and then I select here with the hard button. That is actually really cool. And let's see the lane keeping assist if it's keeping me in the lane. Yeah so far quite well. Now it's a little left bend and not too intrus too intrusive yet. Blind spot monitors also with this vehicle. There's like a warning triangle. Let's see when that Volvo is overtaking us now. There we go. So there's a red triangle then in the side mirror. And then I also get this acoustic warning if I hit the turning indicator. And by the way, when I hit the turning indicator, it feels so sophisticated when you put it down. That's really, really nice, really awesome. This engine here, you do feel that's just good to have a little bit more displacement and if you compare this 2.5 liter against the 2 liter in the G70 so it's just you know more calm on the one hand at the same time it's also more powerful and yeah that's of course a good thing noise insulation here so far so good 120 kilometers an hour so like 70 miles an hour typical motorway speed and I don't have to raise my voice that much. It gives me a very comfortable and pleasing experience. Here, especially the fabric seats are so much more comfortable than the rather stiff, you know, surface from the animal skin. And yeah, so that is also a thing that adds to the comfort, definitely. And agile driving wise, it doesn't shake up too much. So once again, doesn't lean too much into the, in the, into the corners and so on. Feels actually quite sporty. Steering feeling is rather direct. So um, let's see how natural it feels. Yeah, it could feel a little bit more natural. However, I think it's quite okay. And also I feel in the GV70 a little bit better than in the G70. Maybe they tuned that already. So I do feel quite one with the vehicle already. And oh, that's set. I take out okay. That's that's a little bit smaller. But the thing is, really, it's an easy vehicle to learn. You get in the vehicle and you immediately feel at home, and you get along very well. So let's now accelerate from 90 kilometers an hour to what? Let's see. Club, that's 120. 
and about that engine sound by the way you can also go to the main menu and really glad to have this lower control unit because I don't want to you know, put the, my fingers around that uh, screen while driving now I set the cruise control when I'm a little bit distracted it's always um, definitely safer to do and go to settings and then there's here active sound design and let's put it to the enhanced mode let's just to that Yeah, that's interesting so that's not like whoa are we in a v6 now there's also v6 available but we're not in that one here however the 300 horsepower we have here definitely more than enough for this vehicle um, but yeah I feel also that this feels a little bit better sound wise than it does in the two liter four cylinder of the G70 you are gonna check out that video that was a little bit weird how that sound actuator somewhere there so yeah maybe here put it to normal or minimized or something and then I think it's absolutely fine you're also in traffic on the motorway feeling good overview good view to the rear also to the sides and I really have to say this is such a good package they're offering so exterior wise they can easily keep up with the Germans this is of course made of preference interior wise the build quality is great then they find something you know like a compromise of modern things and um, you know still real buttons and things to use and this is just so much better than like the way Mercedes is going now at the moment so this one more like in the direction of um, where BMW has been heading and this one here also feels so much more sophisticated the suspension is really good 19 inch wheels I would also advise not to go for the 21 inch wheels or the 20 inch wheels stick with these one they will deliver best comfort so good compromise of comfort and sportiness and I feel that also the suspension they use here is somehow better than in the bigger models or if that you know reduced weight or something also plays a good role in that so with the G80 and the GV80 I sometimes had like this push in the back like when you're going over some uneven parts of the road like whoa that was not feeling that sophisticated definitely from what we've seen from the interior and also you know driving wise this is the best Genesis model at this moment no doubt about that it feels most sophisticated it feels most modern yet at the same time they've kept some of the elements we are happy that they kept them you know like the manual climate, climate dials and so on it feels really spacious on the inside it's very comfortable here on the German motorway also long term yet at the same time it's so much more agile than their bigger models so this model here for the Genesis lineup does it all it is the best I mean, compromise sounds so bad but it, it takes the best of both worlds you feel like you would be driving a big SUV without having the disadvantages of having like a super large SUV by the way here the top part of the windscreen has like a um, you know it's like a it's like, like a tinting or something so and um, this transition then is really smooth this blue is Thomas blue color of the of the windscreen and therefore most of the time I don't even need to use the additional shield and this really protects against the top part of the Sun also a very clever detail or a very clever feature so they really paid attention to the details with that vehicle and I just love that lane changing by the way feels very natural and once again I'm really happy with the steering here I wasn't quite happy with the steering in the G70 but here obviously in the newer model they worked more on that exactly what I told them with the G70 they should still update well there's a facelift now for that but obviously they you know forgot to put more effort in that let's also push that drive mode selector here and set to sport mode and also enhance sound and yeah this just sounds more spectacular and from you know like 90 kilometers now and we're already at speed let's accelerate it out one seventy kilometers an hour yeah good acceleration very nicely done that was very cool and also here super silent here at, at higher speeds and also very stable I feel this one is even more silent than the sedan version which is you know not logical because it's the SUV and stands more against the wind but once again that proves 
the thing that this is here yeah kind of the most sophisticated genesis vehicle and to me it feels even more silent and also like the you know the bigger brothers yeah they have this active noise cancellation but you maybe know that i'm not such a friend of it here by the way augmented reality in the gps display here this is also pretty cool so um they have a, you know like a better signal of like which lane should i really pick there's a camera image and together then it's showing me okay this is like you know the exit you need to take also a very good feature so um yeah definitely um Really, no matter what the price is, if you ask me at the moment, which generous vehicle would you pick overall from all of them? Haven't driven the all electric one yet, like the G80 all electric, which is coming. But so far, we really have to say the GV70, it will be. You know, there's gaps in the hood and this overlapping hood there in the front, which I could criticize, but here, by the way, once again, the cameras, when you turn, hit the turning indicators, sees another blind spot feature, basically, from the side mirror cams. So, yes, this hood overlapping um, and, yeah, the infotainment system software can always be better. Um, most of the time, probably, you will end up using Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. But it looks at least cool, you know, especially, uh, this is my favorite view of the infotainment system with that kind of screensaver mode, so to speak. But I really have to search for anything that is wrong with this vehicle. There's just hardly anything wrong with this vehicle. It drives very well, so well built, I'm really, really impressed. And I have to say, if we consider now Message GLC, Audi Q5 and BMW X3, they are all excellent vehicles, no doubt. Volvo XC60, um, of course, as well. They are all very, very good. But this one here, is definitely among the best premium mid-size vehicles, period. So, thumbs up here for the Genesis team. And also good for me personal, of course, that they have the leatherette seats in the base option. And they also offer these fabric seats here in the sport line. So they also learned more about that. So it will be very, very interesting if they can succeed on the European market. They are trying to attack the European market right now. They're all really popular in the US and in Europe. It's so tough to compete against all the BMW Mercedes in the premium segment. Will it work? Hmm. If you then think about the pricing, so you can easily live with an entry model of this vehicle and it's already fully packed almost, you know. There's always something you can pick more, but if you compare it then, you know, to the other offerings on the market and you pay like 50k euros or something and you're done. And you can easily save 10,000, 15,000 euros or something to a competitor, which is, you know, similarly respect. So, and then it's not worse in any, in, in any aspect or something, you know. So uh, the price performance in the premium segment here is definitely unmatched. Fuel economy, you have to calculate with some 9 or 10 liters on 100 kilometers. So something below 30 mpg. Run Forest Run for the Porsche Macan T, a new unique model in the Macan lineup. Porsche wants to put a four-cylinder Macan model in a sporty, unique direction. Does that work? Four cylinders will be a more, yeah, one of the most unique models. But maybe it does. It worked for the Boxster T so far, for example, for the 780 models. And here now, the Macanti gets gray accentuations right here. It's a special, unique color. This review also about the facelift of the Macan. First time we have the four-cylinder facelift here. So all the details you need to know about that. Papaya is the color for today. New graphic element here, also with this kind of three-dimensional stamping in the front. So a very interesting approach already visually wise. And the four-cylinder is a little bit lighter on the front axle. Well, we'll try out. Here, it's Thomas and Auto Crew. We drive up the Col de Torini. This is kind of like the king's stage on the Rally Monte Carlo. And we'll find out how agile this Macan T is. 4 meters 73 or 186 inches is the length of the Macan. And you can see here the Macan T gets new interesting accentuations. It starts with 20 inch wheels. We can also see them here. The reason they don't look so large is this vehicle here is still equipped with winter tires. Optional, you can 
even get 21 inch wheels and again, again with summer tires it looks even bigger than then also great contrast here for the side mirrors and also in the lower area right here with the papaya color here today it's a very interesting orange like color it has a very unique combination however if you pick a bright color like a white for example these contrasts will of course appear even stronger maybe than the typical Porsche styling here towards the hip area. Suspension wise this one here comes with a sport yes, but a suspension the PASM Porsche Active Suspension Management minus 50 millimeters but you can also optionally on that get the air suspension which is then even 10 millimeters lower so on the one hand maybe more comfort with the air suspension on the other hand with the even sportier setup these two choices you have. Top speed by the way 230 kilometers an hour or 140 miles an hour so even though it's four cylinder it goes really fast. Have you seen here the white brake calipers? They not only add a very interesting contrast especially here to the gray alloys they also indicate a special brake because these here are the optional PSCB Porsche surface coated brakes tungsten carbide surface that reduces brake dust so it's even basically environmentally better and also better braking performance. Unlike the PCCB, that's the Porsche ceramic composite brake, the even more expensive ceramic brakes also available for the Macan and huge price difference, ceramic brakes towards 10,000 euros or dollars, this year around 3,000, 3,500. In the rear, the facelift recently introduced this new light signature and still goes all the way through. Really impressive, super clean look as well, Macan T logo. And the T also adds these gray elements here as a contrast in the top part, for example. And the lower part also gets a new look here with this, yeah, it's kind of like a three dimensional stamped in and although it's only the four cylinder well <laughs> it's like one pipe per, per cylinder and these are the real thing always spectacular how the hood opens and how the lamps are cut out here really cool <laughs> and here we go this is a two liter four cylinder engine 265 horsepower 6.2 seconds in the acceleration figure unlike the 2.9 liter six cylinder then for the Macan S and GTS but the strange thing is here, hmm, okay, why didn't they boost the power a little bit for the Macan T version? Because it's the same power figure than the normal Macan four cylinder. I would have expected some 300 horsepower here, like in a, you know, like in a Leon or in a just VW Golf R or something. They could have boosted the horsepower. I think it would have been a clever choice to differentiate the T model a little bit more. However, one advantage here for the four cylinder towards the six cylinder, this one here, 60 kilograms less of weight on the front axle that could have a good effect on the driving agility. And some other color choices for you. This one here is Gentian Blue, Enzian Blau in German. Yeah, pretty nice Thomas Blue color, isn't it? Or what about the pure white vehicle here where once again you see these gray contrasts a little bit stronger. This one by the way here, the standard white without any extra price. This is the car key with a typical Porsche form, nicely done, really light. You can get keyless entry, this car however does not have it. Then, door closing sound is actually quite good, not excellent, not bad at all. Then here inside of the doors is rather hard on top, it's not entirely hard but almost hard. Here's a little bit softer for your elbow but also this is quite stiff so it should be a little bit Pleasure, I think actually. Then we also have the Bose sound system here. This is a nice option for music lovers. Then the Macan T has these special entry badges, kind of like you know, dark um, brushed style with the T. Maybe Macan T, Macan Thomas, I don't know. <laughs> then you can also get the race text steering wheel. You know, the microfiber is called race text now since a while for Porsche. It's of course the way to go. I just love it. Great grip both in summer and winter time. That's really lovely. And still can be combined with it heated steering wheel function that is here behind you know hidden behind here and then the seats sport seats with more shoulder support and in the Macan T with fabric inserts also here with these contrast stripes looks really cool however the outside this is still animal skin kind of unnecessary that they did that but let's check out the comfort oh it's nice vintage car sound oh, look at that beamer there look at that you see it you see it Wow, that's cool. Wow. 
I think there's a feature of that in Auto Gefühl about, um, you know, this is the car that Elvis owned, actually. Have you seen that? Wow. That's awesome. So I, I will link the video um, to, the, to the Elvis uh, car special. And now back to our Mark Anti. So the seating position here, since you have more shoulder support, it has good comfort indeed because it takes off weight from your lumbar area. So, uh, and also the fabric insert here is really superior to the full animal skin setup because this one here stays breathable in summertime and it's also not cold in winter. So in this case then really good. The key is still put here in the left part, classic, and then you also really turn it around for the ignition and so on. Steering wheel here with the manual control up and down, in and out, and we also have these classic Porsche gauges where the RPM meter is analog and the central of the whole thing. Only on the right side you have a screen then. You can, for example, also have a map display in there. And I think that's actually a good mix of digital and analog. Interior overview always with this wrapped tight look horizontal stress, new infotainment system soon deals to that. Then also big shifting lever here with microfiber, also newly designed middle console and that race tech steering wheel, really cool. Left side for the volume control, right side for the instrument control and always to have the drive mode selector on the steering wheel. That's a good thing to have. So easily changing the driving modes then while driving and the sports chrono clock. Well, and if you really closely monitor the time in different shots, that will maybe discover that we don't always shoot everything in the chronological order. Maybe someone took a look at it. Infotainment system, 10.9 inch for the Macan facelift now. The car internal GPS looks like this. Not that responsive, of course. It's usable. We're here near the Nice area today. Beautiful in the southern France area. So the thing is, you can use this infotainment system, but most of the time probably will also use Apple CarPlay. Not Android Auto, because Apple CarPlay is the only thing that works here. You see here the integration that is actually quite slim, it's not full screen. Android Auto, by the way, available for Taycan, Panamera and Cayenne in the most recent iterations then. And the sound system here, the Bose sound system is actually yeah, quite cool. So nice sound to be recommended. Besides touch, by the way, you can also use a knob to navigate in the CarPlay. And this is here on the right side. So this would be like a, uh, yeah, like an MMR, MMI controller uh, here. And when you are in the car internal map, then this is actually for the zoom. It's actually quite cool. I like still to have these real physical buttons here on the left side then for the volume. Some decluttering for the facelift here, but we still have this metal knurled control center for the climate. This is actually quite decent. But then here, these capacitive buttons here, also for example, for suspension, you can see here, my fingers are not especially greasy, but this is a surface where you can like see fingerprints all over the place in the cup holders, adaptive, that's good. And then here, that's how you attach an armrest. This is really, like, you cannot shake it at all good perceived quality. Then here, USB-C chargers, one and two. And inductive charging would be putting your smartphone here and then face the screen to the outside, not the most practical solution. Rear seating area, you also have the sporty fabric inserts with the stripes, that's actually quite cool. You do see you have a large middle tunnel, now with a facelift also two USB-C chargers. And then let's take a look about the leg room well i have the seat as i would be driving and that gets very close it does fit for four tall adults but it gets really close so leg room is not the specialty of the macan we also have this vehicle here equipped with the very nice race text ceiling here that's actually cool and some headroom left there's also an optional panoramic roof available seating comfort in the rear is actually quite decent so um it's actually good. I mean, the, the bolt string is stiff, but still, you know, it's very comfortable indeed. As for adjustment of the seat, there's nothing to be done here besides then, you know, folding it here. Um, there are also no you know, different, you know, angles or something available. Here in the middle part, you can fold that one down for adaptive cup holders. Once again, nice build quality. You can also use this one here as a ski edge. And then, well, in that middle console here, well, 
sitting on the middle part is kind of tough that will get close with you know with the legs and so on but it is theoretically possible also for five tall adults but then again yeah big middle tunnel and so on always a highlight to open the Macan trunk here from the outside with this button right there it's just a nice idea i think and then the length of that trunk is a little bit less than a meter or 40 inches the width is exactly a meter or 40 inches and the height to the cover is about 50 centimeters or almost 20 inches you see here the backpack also fits in easily and you can fold the seats one third two thirds bit or with that ski hatch and the total length then is one meters 70 plus or 60 seven inches plus welcome to thomas's active driving lounge and we're pulled here to the sports plus mode and going up the col de torini so this is the most favorite or most famous stage of the rally monte carlo tour de france was also here so a little bit slower of course but here we use it today for the macan t see if that four cylinder even got it although it's just four cylinders but we have less weight on the front axle and they also change the suspension setup here stiffer suspension in this case we have the air suspension which is even a little bit lower even more in the sports mode so it goes even lower then and also the all-wheel drive distribution it already has a rear wheel bias but here in the Macan T it is even more rear wheel bias I can also see it here in the distribution that I have always more power on the rear wheels and that definitely helps us to get out of the corners and here going uphill of course that's a special thing to check then with the corners great steering super direct a little bit screaming of the tires here oh, that feels so nicely such a great handling of that SUV I don't even feel we are like boosted up in any way or something really feels like a low sitting sports car race tech steering wheel with the microfiber surface here that is awesome wow this has such a balanced handling so from the pure handling and you know the weight distribution front rear and wow i mean it is air suspension here in this case so you do have comfort also over some bumps at the same time it's actually yeah i mean it, it's sporty and comfortable at the same time so this is also a good thing then here with that optional air suspension the pasm will also do fine of course but here you have more possibilities to make it more comfortable in the comfort mode and sportier than in the sports mode and wow this is so much fun this goes up the hill so smooth really nice of course here you hear the engine is working we only have the four cylinder power again it's good for the handling and for the weight but when i want to be really on the gas sometimes i think yeah maybe the power from the sink cylinder could do a little bit better to be a little bit more spontaneous yeah, but I mean, it is good performance, no doubt about that. Sound, of course, is something we are missing. So you might have think, ah, maybe they could have done some sound emulation or something. That would have been something. Sport Plus mode, by the way, also the stability control is being drawn back, so I can play a little bit more around with that vehicle. Wow, I'm having so much fun going up here, these windy corners. Wow, what a landscape here now. We're getting higher and higher. The peak will be soon at 1,600 meters. That's about 5,200 feet. So quite a bit of elevation here. Air gets thinner. That also has a toll on the engine performance, of course. You know that. So the thinner the air, the higher the, it goes up. It's always a thing, you know, like in, in racing, of course, when you're racing in high altitude. And yeah, I mean, a lot of legends have gone up this hill. Walter Roll, of course, Colin McRae, Sebastian Loeb, Sebastian Augier, and so on. And I mean, it's crazy. I all already feel that we would be going really fast here, but they are actually going up this hill like, you know, double or triple the speed at least. And that's absolutely crazy how narrow that is here. Yeah, come on, that performance in here from that engine. Wow. And still, I mean, suspension is so well thought out. I don't feel it's a bad choice to make it a little bit stiffy in this case. Sometimes the stiff sport suspensions are just annoying because they're too stiff. Here in the sports mode especially, of course, it is stiffer than even in a normal mode. But you can still do so much things with that vehicle. A little bit of the tire screen. Ah, now nicely done. 
more rear drive than from the front and that really pushes me out of the corners. That is so cool. <sighs> lovely, just absolutely lovely. Little bit of sliding around in the rear. So that is even possible with that four cylinder. So from the driving agility, you do not miss these two cylinders at all. It's such an awesome vehicle. So if you want to save some money, stick with the four cylinder. Maybe taxation in your country is bad for the six cylinders or something. The Macan T is an excellent opportunity to spice up your four cylinder life here for the Macan. That's, I think, a great sweet spot. Here yeah, in these situations, you know, when we were like braked in, you know, by some really narrow corners, then that six cylinder performance could help me a little bit more to get it up to the RPMs, that definitely. And of course, the sound is better with the six cylinders. So these are the two things you have to bear in mind. But other than that, I mean, this is easily the best sporty SUV in this segment. And I would say really by far, I mean, um, currently at home I have a BMW X3 M40i, which is an awesome vehicle, no doubt. And of course, also with that six cylinder, but from the pure driving agility, how we can put this around in the corners. Seats are holding us tight as well, good shoulder support, and of course, more breathable with these fabric inserts here. And the combination, you know, like seating, steering wheel here, the size and the directness, how smooth it feels. And I have such a great um, connection, driver, vehicle, and road. Yeah, I mean, this is really, as good as it gets for an SUV. If you might compare it to the Cayenne, for example, for yeah, to the bigger brother, this one here, of course, sportier just because of the weight, of the size and so on. So the Macan is definitely more fun to steer around, especially here in these narrow corners. And this is here also pure auto fuel. Look at that here now, S corners, lovely. And you might see the pictures on TV and it's always something completely different when you're in that yourself. Oh, this is so awesome. Woo! <laughs> what else we can do? We can um, you go to the you know, EC Sport, PSM Sport, or yeah, in that case, PSM Sport. Um, there's, by the way, when I press and hold it, let's see, we can also completely turn it off. That's not recommended for public roads, so I also want to be responsible here. PSM Sport is kind of enough, and that actually draws back the stability control even more. And you should only use it when you really know the vehicle very well and you know what you're doing, actually. So, and of course, you have to be even more careful. But in this case, then, um, the effect that I'm being you know, like drawn back by the brakes or something in the corners is a little bit reduced. However, here on dry road conditions, um, doesn't make the biggest difference than here since this car is very balanced anyway. And also that Sport Plus mode already takes back the stability control, all these electronic helpers. Wow, I'm really impressed. So when they said they want to make a four-cylinder Macan unique, they definitely made that with that little exceptions here. Uh, but well, fun-wise, driving-wise, I mean, just for the pure driving agility, you know, and the weight distribution, is that even better with the six cylinder uh, than, than the six cylinder? That might even be the case. So, I mean, 60 kilograms might not be like 120 pounds on the front axle less. It doesn't sound too much actually, but when you're in the more extreme conditions here, more in these running corners, that can actually be a, some kind of a difference. And, once again, I'm having so much fun here and I can't remember, you know, that I ever had so much fun in an SUV in so tight corners. SUVs can be sport, we know that. They're a special sports version by almost all manufacturers, by the way. And we have driven them on racetracks and also on sporty roads. But this is here, it's really, really narrow. I'm not sure if it's really transport on camera. Maybe you can also see like the, some of the stuff there in the infotainment system. But that an SUV is fun in so tight corners, it has to be really good from the setup. Yeah, of course, and here now EC Sport doesn't make a big difference because I have to be careful, you know, that I'm not too hard on the throttle. And 
the difference with the EC Sport would be rather than really when you push the throttle even further. Wow. That guy, respect, man. I mean, <laughs> it's already tough to go up here by car. Yeah, that's a safe spot. Yeah, and even that, you know, still got some power reserves from that four cylinder. Really nice. Wow, one, one more time, heads off, guys. We're getting higher and higher and higher, and does the engine feel, you know, somehow weaker now? Maybe a little. Wow. What do you say, Michelle, as co-driver today? Co-driver is very important in rally racing, you know. So you haven't you haven't given me any directions though, you know. Like usually, like, like two left line and one right, and don't cut. Well, three left, three right. I guess this makes you the biggest legend who's ever driven on this track before, sir. So. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Michelle. Thank You're you welcome. so much. Yeah. Uh, I mean, who, who was it? Was it was it also Colin McRae? Who like, you know, um, at one time said like, ah, oh, you know, to be honest, I never listened to my co-driver ever. <laughs> All the co-drivers in the scene were freaking out. Like, how can he say that? <laughs> no, of course, the co-drivers are really important. Even it's similar to you, no? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe Colin, Gray, Colin McRae uh, and I are maybe like, you know, I don't know. Brothers at, brothers at heart, I don't know, and yeah, totally sad story what happened to him, and yeah, God bless him, and uh, we really wish he would be still racing out there. By the way, if you drive this car slowly, cruise control motorway, you can score some 9 liters on 100 kilometers, like 26 mpg US, 31 mpg UK, <laughs> sorry, I have to concentrate on driving as well, not only on a few economy figures, and here, um, you know, when we're driving up the hill here, then rather some 14, 15 liters on one kilometers, of course, and way less than 20 mpg, both US and UK. So, and this is now, you know, some part where we drive kind of like through the forest, also some different scenery, a little bit faster, and the final stages will then be once again a little bit tighter. So here yeah, also really cool how the air suspension help us like also when there's some rollers or something that is awesome and that steering it really feels like it would be transported over from the 780 models you know and that's why just driving wise my favorite Porsche models are really the Macan and the 780 Boxster because they drive so well balanced and the other ones just feel bigger the Cayenne will do some better long-term comfort and so on but if you really, really want some more purist driving fun yeah and that's also where the T models T stands for touring by the way not for Thomas <laughs> so there where the Porsche T models are really um, you know positioned for that touring aspect so just like here you know you have, are on a nice tour but you also want to drive it in a very sporty way and rather reduce it to the max be a little bit more purist and the Boxer T or the Cayman T is to me the more essential part of Porsche uh, not going always for the highest horsepower figure and for the biggest spec and so on the PCCB the ceramic brakes are not available anymore for the Macan by the way just um, mentioned the price difference earlier just for you know curiosity and now the corners get tighter once again and we are so lucky that we have no one in front of us and not so many cyclists here today because that can happen so really a unique chance to drive up this road in such a nice weather with such a clear track and it's so great that you actually joined us for that and enjoy this one here on tape as much as we do look also how the steering ratio really fits to that road so when I'm in a 90 degree turn I also turn the steering 90 degrees that's really awesome I love that really nice progressive smooth everything is in one flow and that is something you know I usually only you know maybe achieve in mountain biking or something or downhill mountain biking what I also do you have you know what I really feel at this moment is this so-called flow and when you have like a favorite hobby or something you might know what I'm talking about you are in the moment you're not thinking of anything else all the problems you might have in this world are just gone and you are in this flow you are just in the moment you're steering the vehicle you're handling throttle steering 
well, clutch <laughs> and uh, shifting is done by the vehicle. However, I can also do it myself here with the shifting pedals. That might also be some fun idea. And then maybe we can keep it, for example, the gear lower. The sports mode is already keeping the gears lower, definitely. But here, with the sh uh, shifting myself, I can do that as well. And keeping the RPMs even a little bit higher, that bring, brings me more agility. And here, when we have a little bit more open road, then also the ESC sport mode has a bigger effect. The surface here is a little bit tougher now. You might also hear some you know, rattling from the interior now because of our camera equipment because so much rattling forces are then applied. Here now also the road gets a little bit, you know, um, slippery because of the, you know, some very small loose stones on there. To be careful for that, always be ready. Wow. And we are getting closer and closer towards the peak. Second gear, third, maybe even fourth, going back. Yeah, it's also so much fun to use the shifting pedals. It's small, but really precise, give you nice feedback. Oh my God. I mean, on camera, things look always slower than they really are because you do not feel the G-forces and the camera angles are also sometimes deceiving. But I'm telling you, we were really, really fast here so far. Now it opens up. This has been yeah, probably one of the coolest things here we've ever done in a sporty SUV. What a journey, what an experience. A Volvo SUV comparison for you with Thomas and Autogefühl. Volvo XC40 versus the bigger Volvo XC60. This will be very interesting. Let's directly start here in the front with the XC40, the smaller brother, with a very upright, strong design, three-dimensional curved in design here in the very front grille, and Thor's Hammer LED signature, really beautiful, and thunder gray is that color, whereas we have denim blue with the bigger XC60. Now, although it's the bigger car, the front looks a little bit less upright but still a strong look and here also with the vertical fins, depending on the trim, it also differs a little bit. So you can see that they both belong to the Volvo family, but I think the XC40 design is maybe a little bit fresher or what do you think? Tell me in the comments. Side profile and technology comparison. Let's start here with the length of the XC40, which is 4 meters 43 or 174 inches. And you more have a crossover look right here and a three dimensional look, especially in the lower area and very distinctive, this top side profile here. Now the XC60 is 26 centimeters or 10 inches longer than the XC40. Technology difference is that we also optionally have an air suspension here and you can see wheel arch wise for example also from the whole side silhouette it looks a little bit less crossoverish and a little more elaborate I would say. The question is if this length difference also translates into more room on the inside or more trunk, we'll find out very soon. And also about the prices. Obviously, the XC60 is more expensive. How much and how much is the price exactly for these top trim test vehicles? Later on, this will be super interesting. Well, in the front, I preferred the XC40 design. In the side profile, I preferred the XC60 design. Here in the rear now, they have some similarities, you know, like the basic form right here and also the vertical lamps, but then it changes it right here. Also different as for the turning indicators. This looks a little bit more modern than in this case. Yeah, I would still go for the XC60 as for the visual design part. Also in the rear, I would say, and even more interesting, of course, how the turning indicators look like in the front. That's the same here for both. Looks quite amazing, doesn't it? Engine choices. What the hell? Have you seen this? I mean, I've never seen a hood that opens that wide. I mean, an elephant could serve as this one here <laughs> by that wide opening. That's, it looks strange, doesn't it? Anyways, engine choices, petrol, diesel, plug-in hybrid petrol and all EV, all electric, already for the XC40. That is not available yet for the XC60. It will come at a later stage than with the all new generation. And also the XC40 here has a 1.5 liter petrol three cylinder and the 1.5 liter three cylinder is also the base for the plug-in hybrid. Whereas 
Then of course the rest of the engines are the two liter four cylinders. And this then, you know, here the XC60 only has the two liter four cylinders, petrol, diesel, and also for the base plug-in hybrid. People always say the cars look tiny when I'm standing next to them. But I guess I can't be too tall for this one, right? <laughs> <laughs> Let's get to the interior of the XC40, normal Volvo key, door closing sound. Yeah, pretty solid, really nice. And also here from the interior materials, the structure inside and also soft touch. And they make it from one piece here. That's actually very nicely done. Also the felt interior of the inside door pockets is really nice. And also more sustainable material choices and so on. The interior. Typical Scandinavian design here in this case with the fabric seats that does have some wool share. If you want to go completely animal free, there's also black fabric seat available, depending on the version, also leatherette seat or also microfiber leatherette mix. The XC40 EV, the all electric version, is completely animal free by default. Here in the lower part, you can also put that back and it looks even nicer. Here is then a little bit longer. The big question will be, I mean, the XC40, considering it's a compact SUV, already feels quite grown up. And if you compare the XC40 to the brand external competitors, like a Mercedes GLA, for example, this one feels more SUV, whereas some of the other competitors more feel crossover. That's the thing I really like about the XC40. Headroom, here this one does have the panoramic roof and then it leaves some headroom with 189 or 6 foot 2. The panoramic roof, let me turn on the ignition right here. Panoramic roof here, you can see you can put this slider here back. So when it's really hot, it's really important to have that. But you see there is the split, so it's also a panoramic roof which you can actually still open. That's of course a cool thing to have. So the big question will be when we soon will switch over to the XC60, does it deliver more seating comfort than the XC40 that it would be worth stepping up the segment? I think the ergonomics are really good. Volvo seats in general have also good seat ergonomics for tall people. That's what I like. But really looking forward if there will be a crucial difference very soon. Interior overview, also simple here. Recently with the facelift, you see these structured design patterns right here. Also nine inch screen. Don't be mistaken, this will also soon get the Android Automotive system. This is one of the last engine versions here that hasn't gotten it yet. So soon all XC40 will also get the Android Auto system. So we won't waste time on this and check it out in the XC60. Here clearly one central knob still. This will be the same for the volume, everything else then wire touch. In the lower part you can see USB-A connector but also inductive charging pad underneath. And in this case we have this crystalline shifting lever and goes back like this or forward for reverse. The cup holes are adaptive and then we also have decent build quality here for the arm rest. Underneath even more space. What I love about the XC40 is here the matte styling of the buttons at the steering wheel. The XC60 will soon get the high gloss buttons here. You will soon see that in our video. So I do prefer the solution right here. Instruments, these are the so far or older ones. If you buy used, for example, if you buy a new XC40 for most versions and soon also for this version here, you will then get the Android Automotive instruments we will soon see in the XC60. Really nice interior materials also here at the rear door, soft touch as well, and again with the felt accentuation. And you sit very well here in the rear as well. So it's as small as SUV, the XC40 here, and still there are some leg room left here. No problem for four tall adults. Five. Mm, there's a substantial middle tunnel. However, when you <laughs> you know have squeezed yourself in here, it does work. So also decently com comfortable. Of course, the outside seats are more comfortable, but overall very well usable here. Fold down like this, adaptive cup holders. So overall, as for the offering of space here, already very nicely done. Uh, this wool material, by the way, I think it doesn't feel that good because it feels a little bit rough from the surface. I would indeed tend to pick the base fabric seats or then in the R design, the microfiber mix. 
yeah, maybe on, depending on the version you have on the market or the full leather red. So, but I do prefer the normal fabric seats. To me, they are most breathable and also from the surface, they feel best actually. The microfiber seats, however, will probably look the best. Key fob, the same, and also door closing sound. It's really good, flawless, and also comparable interior materials here from the top. But then there is, let's say, less design focus here a little bit. This looks more clean in the XC40. And also the XC40 has the felt on the inside, where here is the black plain plastic. Steering wheel is comparable. And also the seat, as for the material in the US, by the way, and also in Germany, you can get a black fabric or also a bright city weave material that is also animal free with a special styling. These ones here, again, the, you know, the fabric with a little bit of wool share. The UK does lack animal free options, sadly, for the XC60. And you can see the seat is a little bit more, let's say, has a little bit more form to it. But also, does it, really, you know, does it translate into more comfort? That's the big question. The XC40 already feels grown up as for an SUV. And indeed, what you feel here in the front in the XC60 is it doesn't feel big of a difference. You know, when you compare BMW X1 to X3 or Mercedes GLA to GLC, Audi Q3 to Q5, you feel more of a difference than here Volvo XC40 to Volvo XC60. That rather speaks for the XC40 because it's a cheaper vehicle cheap in relative you know terms um, here you feel you have a little bit more space to the front with the hood and so on a little bit more headroom but it's um whatever that was but it wouldn't really justify the extra price so the seats here they are to me a little bit firmer even even though they offer a little bit more bolstering but i wouldn't say that the x60 is more comfortable it's also comfortable but sitting here in the front Maybe I would even go for the XC40. Here, by the way, the panoramic roof. There's also then one with the shade. Basically, it works the very same way. Here now also with this capacitive touch. And then you can also open that whole thing. So indeed, from the front already, both the smaller and the bigger one are quite comparable. In the overview, you have these accentuations here with the matte wood. That's actually lovely done, but the base layout with a 9-inch screen is more or less the same. And then we do have this Android Automotive screen here, now for all, almost all the Volvo models. And big news, recent upgrade, now Apple CarPlay also for the Android Automotive systems in Volvo and Polestar being rolled out by over-the-air updates is an integration and all over the screen. And that's actually cool. And in this case, then I can use the Google Maps from the Apple CarPlay, but also the Google Maps, which is inbuilt by this Android automotive system. They do not offer Android Auto, by the way. This is just the Android Auto is the smartphone mirroring. Android Automotive is the whole system. Because I say, hey, you get the Google Maps integration anyway. Your phone you can connect via Bluetooth, and that's basically it. Not sure you could also offer that, you know, um, Renault does also offer that with Android Automotive, both CarPlay and Android Auto, who is getting used to it. So this whole system here is really fast, also the Google Maps integration is nice, and it doesn't offer so much complexity, but it gives you everything you need, and it's fast and reliable, and that's a really great thing to have. Middle console also with these nice covers, and whew, this one slide open for the cup holders. In the front, there's just this tiny cubby hole, 12 volt power supply. And then you can fold up this armrest and then there's here the USB-C chargers then. Steering wheel with real buttons here as well. And then if you move to the instruments, they have this Android Automotive U, which will count for all the Volvos. Here you can see with the map integration or without, pretty simple, does the job. And here for the XC60, can also get a head-up display. XC60 here in the rear, that is really interesting. First of all, at the inside of doors, also nice materials. But once again, the look in the XC40 is a little bit more uncluttered here. A lot of different elements. Bowers and Wilkins is the top sound system here, by the way. But to me, sound-wise, it's not better than the Harman Kardon in the XC40. Maybe from the sound experience, I even like the Harman Kardon more. Here, as for the headroom, also some left, but lacrum here. Yeah, that's basically the same result we have in the XC40. So it's not that you wouldn't have more space here in the XC60, 
Will that difference be in the trunk? We'll soon find out. And then here in the middle part, yeah, I mean, you can also see, but the same, once again here, a little bit stiffer in the back part. And then we fold down this. We have here these couples that are a little bit more forward, actually. But overall, yeah, both in the front and also here in the rear, the space and comfort are really comparable, both XC40 and XC60. And now the trunks or the boots fight it out. Let's begin with the smaller one, the XC40. The liter difference is around 50 liters, but what is it in length and width here? The length about 90 centimeters or 35 inches and the width a little bit less than a meter or 40 inches. So let's remember that, but overall well usable. This here in case of the plug-in hybrid, a cable box. And then of course the height of the trunk is a little bit limited with the plug-in hybrid. You have to fold the seats from the rear area. When we move over to the XC60, so leader capacity is a little bit more. The height is more or less the same. Here also a little bit reduced because of the plug-in hybrid version. But here, now the big difference is the length here, you can see it's about yeah, it's a little bit less than a meter or 40 inches. So you gain about this here, you know, in length and also in the width. You can see it's more than a meter or 40 inches. So yeah, about this you gain. So yeah, almost 10 centimeters or four inches. So once again, this more in width and, you know, like this more in length. So indeed, from the basic things here, the big advantage of the XC60 is indeed you have more trunk capacity and more width and more length. Is it really worth it? Is it that big of a difference? I wouldn't say it's not so significant if you think about everyday practicability, but it does change something if you are a family and you're driving you know, on holiday or something. And one big difference we can already see right here, because here, if you have the optional air suspension, then you can also lower the vehicle here for better loading in and out. And air suspension, that is something only the XC. XC60 is offering and not the smaller brother. Welcome to Thomas's comparison driving lounge. Starting here with the Volvo XC40 with the smaller one and it will be really interesting to find out all about the differences. Blind spot monitor here in the side mirror. That's a very good assistance system. And it feels really light and compact just as the size is. Steering here is quite direct, but it doesn't give you the best feeling, meaning you don't have a natural feeling for the car. It feels a little bit artificial. Seating comfort is really good, and as I said earlier, in the interior part, it already feels somewhat grown up. So you don't miss a bigger SUV, at least when you're driving the smaller one here. <laughs> well, in the front here, there's not an XC60, it's a V60 actually. Uh, yeah, sometimes hard to differentiate because they can also be put a little bit higher, especially when it's a cross-country version. Well, in normal city driving, it's already quite silent. We soon also head out to the German motorway, the Autobahn. And it overall gives you a very relaxed, calm, and just a good feeling here. So the, the roundabout package of the driving feeling is really very nice. You know, you have a decent size on the interior, not too big, not too long on the exterior. And that's why it's also relatively easy to steer it around in the city. You get the you know, most parking spots and so on. This can also be a big advantage if you compare it to the XC60 that you can just easier park it in and out, easier ease it in the parking lot. So that's what I really like about the XC40 right here. All right, now let's go to the motorway. Yeah, almost a little bit faster. Good side handling, feels really nice. You have a lot of driving fun indeed in the XC40. The suspension is quite firm, I have to say, but not too bad. So bumps are also even out quite well. I think they found a nice setup here for the suspension. Remember, no air suspension is available here, but in this segment is absolutely fine if they don't offer that and you also don't really need it. Although we have quite big wheels mounted here, the 19-inch wheels, 
it's not too uncomfortable from bumps in the road and so on and here also higher speeds you know more than 100 kilometers an hour or more than 60 miles an hour reasonably insulated here so you really get a premium SUV feeling here once again a little bit sportier in that next right corner it's always cool when we switch motorways from one to another then you can really test the agility seats also keep you quite tight especially if you have a fabric based seat in this case here we have the plug-in hybrid drivetrain but drivetrain comparison won't play the biggest effect here in this comparison it will just play a big role if you have the all-electric version which is offered in the XC40 and in the C40 there's also a separate video on that actually but both in the city countryside and on the motorway the XC40 feels very well balanced and it can actually master every discipline no no problem the big question is now what about the X60 is it really better for the extra price you pay is it more or less fun to drive well and now to the XC60 told you in the interior part the basic seating position is not too different maybe the seat is a little bit larger but then again the cushion is a little bit firmer so I wouldn't really say that this delivers more comfort or so and at, at first glance we also had equal space set up in the rear and so on yeah a little bit bigger trunk and so on so it's really up to the driving part now if there is a significant difference and if the extra price is really justified of course you can also go with the XC60 with a normal suspension then the suspension setup won't be that different here however the optional air suspension and that of course delivers more driving comfort however we do have 20 inch wheels mounted on here and that also leads to that these fine changes in the road are more transported to your body and, and you feel them um, yeah and the, the the basic setup here you know when you go some left right is then rather a little bit softer that's the basic difference and the xc 60 is not for racing clearly not none of the volvos are is more for enjoying and driving a little bit calmer not feeling the urge to accelerate it all out and so on and the engines are also not laid out on that anyway it's also good noise insulation it feels really calm on the inside and also mm, you know because it's a little bit longer it sits a little bit more settled on the road so from the chassis and suspension wise it feels a little bit more grown up and a little bit more sophisticated it's also how it's supposed to be also the hood there is a little bit longer and so on but the thing is really that my basic impression from sitting in the cockpit is basically confirmed because it's not the biggest difference so once again here inside the there's another that was a c40 actually so inside this volvo model portfolio the difference between xc40 and xc60 also driving wise is not as large as you would expect it i'll soon also hop onto the same motorway part and move it a little bit more you know in, in an agile way to see more comparison about that but yeah so i think seating position wise maybe I'm, I'm i think i'm even a little bit happier with the xc40 just you know running straight and enjoying a more you know serenity rides so to speak that might be a little bit better than in the xc city xc city that could be a new volvo suv right so all well, guys i just invent a new name for you for the for you know when they have like, a, like an even smaller suv xc city so i mean <laughs> XC. thank you <laughs> um, yeah the XC60 here so it still feels good also in the city of course you're a little bit more limited as for parking in and out if you directly compare it to the smaller XC40 um, still agile enough definitely yeah here when when you approach for example the traffic light and there's some like waves and you feel that the air suspension is evening it out a little bit more so um, yeah just feels a little bit more sophisticated but 
as I said, the difference is not too large. How is it now when I drive it, for example, you know, from a traffic light, from zero around the corner, 90 degree bend here now, and also on the motorway, here we go, Bring around the corner. Yeah, there the, the XC40 just feels a little bit lighter, you know, and also, you know, when I'm going some right, right, left here, legs a little bit behind, so the XC40 gives you a more direct connection when you have the steering input and so on. The basic steering setup feels kind of similar because it is direct for the steering input, then again, doesn't feel that natural, you don't get the best feeling for the car, but what I meant is, when you do a steering command and then how the suspension or the chassis, you know, changes right, left, and how you feel all together. With the XC40, you feel more one with the vehicle, and here you feel more, okay, the vehicle is driving for you, more or less, you know. That's how, would I, how I would describe the difference. Now we get to the German Autobahn, see how it is in that, uh, in that faster corner to slow down here just a little before that. Both plug-in hybrid drivetrains, by the way, today to make it comparable. Of course, you always have these electric driving moments and it's all silent. And when you push a little bit further, then the combustion engine also sets in. If the plug-in hybrid makes sense, depends really on the driving profile and also on tax subsidies and so on. Um, I'm not the biggest fan of plug-in hybrids. I rather tend to go, hey, still get the petrol engine pure or go all electric and decide depending on the charging charging infrastructure you have here now in the corner still fun to drive it pushes me and leans a little bit more outward than the xc40 definitely but still feels good and here now a little higher speeds so also motorway speeds also decently silent it's more silent than the xc40 probably the same right michelle yeah michelle also agrees so uh wouldn't say that there's much, maybe, and maybe if we want to score I think this one maybe, I'm not sure. So, doesn't feel like the big, the biggest difference, at least, because the XC40 also has dual insulation glass and so on. So everything fine also in that respect. Um, I feel that from the whole chassis and the length of the vehicle, I would rather go with this one for the motorway. But when I just rate the very seat I'm sitting on, I think I would even go with the XC40. So the best motorway setup to me would be actually the, you can also, you know, electronically adjust everything and so on. Let's see. Yeah, doing that. There we go. It's the Lama support, for example. Um, yeah. So I would take the XC40 seat, but with the XC60 chassis for the best motorway setup, but both are comfortable and also good motorway rides, no doubt about that. Um, yeah, that is really, really interesting. So both deliver you a very interesting and very good ride. The XC60 then maybe, yeah, to give you a little bit more calmness, the XC40 for a little bit more directness and driving fun. As I said, in the newer generations, or well, newer versions, newer model years, and also already the XC40 EV and the Pure Petrol and so on, they all now get the Android automotive system here right and also left in the instruments, depending on when exactly you are buying, and also maybe if you're buying used or so. So um, even in driving, not the biggest of a difference. That's very interesting. So might be a very close call or will it be let's check out our final conclusion well what do we do now which one would i actually take home and also considering the price difference so if you start with the base version it's more like 35 44 or something in euros thousand euros of course so just like like an eight thousand euros price difference but then the higher you spec them and the higher go also in the engines and so on, the price difference is rising. And here with the higher trim levels and so on, and also as plug-in hybrid, we are at the concise prices of 64,000 euros and 88,000 euros. So, spec the price difference then triples 
And yeah, when you then think about this massive price difference of 24,000 euros, and just as for the price performance, it's clearly the XC40. As for the exterior, well, in the front, I like the XC40 better. The XC60 inside and the rear, but wouldn't be the biggest difference to me. Interior-wise, also quite similar from the styling. Surprising thing is that the XC40 doesn't have less space on the interior or something. It's just more that the trunk space is a little bit, little bit limited. The XC60 has a longer and wider trunk. That would be the main, let's say, hard fact difference. And that optionally you can also get an air suspension. Driving-wise, also the difference is not as large as you might expect. The XC60 may be a little bit more know, a little bit more sophisticated in the driving, but I found the seating position, the ergonomics with the seats even a little bit better with the XC40. Well, and then when you consider the price difference and also that you get along a little bit better in the city, to me today, the clear winner is the Volvo XC40. It's also available as a pure electric version already now, also as the C40, as this coupe shape.